Oh, that was good. Good morning. I call the meeting of the Appropriations Committee to order, and I would like to welcome all members back to full committee to consider the Transportation, Housing, and Urban Development and Agricultural Bills. Before turning to those bills, however, our first order of business is to consider the further revised sub-allocation of budget allocations for fiscal year 2020. These revised sub-allocations incorporate adjustments provided by the Committee on the Budget to reflect funding recommendations already approved by this committee for overseas contingency operations. The 2020 Census and wildfire suppression activities. The revised sub-allocations also make minor technical adjustments to outlays for the bills yet to be considered and to reflect the scoring of bills already reported to the House. These changes are non-controversial, do not substantively change the funding recommendations already adopted by this committee and I urge my colleagues to support them. I will now turn to Ranking Member Granger for any remarks she may have. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, for yielding. And uh, while the changes in the revised subcommittee allocations are technical and consistent with the majority's budget deeming resolution, I must oppose them. Appropriations bills drafted these unrealistic subcommittee allocations will not become law. I want to work with our House colleagues, the Senate, and the administration in a bipartisan way to develop a fiscally responsible budget framework that prioritizes national security and prevents sequestration. Otherwise, defense could face more than $70 billion in cuts below the current levels, crippling our military capabilities. I urge a no vote, and I yield back my time. Does any other member Does any other member wish to speak on the allocations? Are there any amendments to the report? If there are no <coughs> amendments and no further discussion, I recognize Ms. Captor for a motion to approve the revised 302B allocations. The question <coughs> is on the motion. Marcy. Marcy. Oh, I recognize. Oh. Just move. Madam uh, Chairwoman, I move that the committee approve the revised report on the 302B allocations for fiscal year 2020. The question is on the motion. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say no. No. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. A recorded vote has been requested. All those in favor of a recorded vote, raise your hand. A sufficient number being in support, a recorded vote is ordered. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Adderholt. Mr. Adderholt, no. Mr. Aguilar. Aye. Mr. Aguilar, aye. Mr. Amade. Aye. Mr. Bishop. Aye. Mr. Bishop, aye. Mrs. Bustos. Aye. Mrs. Bustos, aye. Mr. Calvert. Mr. Calvert, no. Mr. Carter. No. Mr. Carter, no. Mr. Cartwright. Aye. Mr. Cartwright, aye. Mr. Case. Aye. Mr. Case, aye. Ms. Clark. Aye. Ms. Clark, aye. Mr. Cole. Aye. Mr. Cole, no. Mr. Christ. Aye. Mr. Christ, aye. Mr. Cuellar. Aye. Mr. Cuellar, aye. Mr. Loro. Aye. Mr. Loro, aye. Mr. diaz Ballard. Mr. diaz Ballard, no. Mr. Fleischman. No. Mr. Fleischman, no. Mr. Fortenberry. Mr. Fortenberry, no. Ms. Frankel. Aye. Ms. Frankel, aye. Ms. Granger. No. Ms. Granger, no. Mr. Graves. Dr. Harris. Dr. Harris, no. Ms. Herrera Butler. Mr. Hurd. Mr. Hurd, no. Mr. Joyce. Mr. Joyce, no. Ms. Captor. Aye. Mr. Captor, aye. Mr. Kilmer. Mr. Kilmer, aye. Mrs. Kirkpatrick. Aye. Mrs. Kirkpatrick, aye. Mrs. Lawrence. Aye. Mrs. Lawrence, aye. Ms. Lee. Aye. Ms. Lee, aye. Mrs. Lowy. Aye. Mrs. Lowy, aye. Ms. McCollum. Ms. McCollum, aye. Ms. Ming. <coughs> Ms. Ming, aye. Mr. Molinar. Mr. Molinar, no. Mr. Newhouse. Mr. Newhouse, no. Mr. Palazzo. Mr. Palazzo, no. Ms. Pingree. 
Ms. Pingree, aye. Mr. Pocan. Aye. Mr. Pocan, aye. Mr. Price. Aye. Mr. Price, aye. Mr. Quigley. Aye. Mr. Quigley, aye. Mrs. Roby. Aye. Mrs. Roby, no. Mr. Rogers. Mr. Rogers, no. Ms. Robo Allard. Aye. Ms. Robo Allard, aye. Mr. Rupesberger. Mr. Rupesberger, aye. Mr. Rutherford. Mr. Rutherford, no. Mr. Ryan. Mr. Serrano. Aye. Mr. Serrano, aye. Mr. Simpson. Mr. Simpson, no. Mr. Stewart. No. Mr. Stewart, no. Mrs. Torres. Mrs. Torres. Mrs. Torres, aye. Mr. Viskoski. Mr. Viskoski, aye. Ms. Wasserman Schultz. Ms. Wasserman Schultz, aye. Mrs. Watson Coleman. Mrs. Watson Coleman, aye. Mr. Womack. Mr. Womack, no. Does any member wish to record their vote or change their vote? Mr. Graves, no. The clerk will tally. On this vote, the ayes are 29, the noes are 21, the report is approved. The second order of business today is consideration of the Transportation, Housing, and Urban, Urban Development Appropriations Bill for fiscal year 2020. I will now recognize Mr. Price to present the bill. Thank you, Madam Chair, and good morning, everyone. It's my pleasure to present the fiscal year 2020 Transportation, Housing, and Urban Development Bill. Uh, a lot of people to thank. First, I want to thank uh, my partner in this effort for many years now, Mario diaz Ballard, our ranking member. His approach is always cooperative, always collaborative. He's been a pleasure to work with over the past years with, uh, in his chairmanship when I was the ranking member and now that our roles have been reversed. I also want to thank full committee chairwoman Nita Lowy for her leadership and in particular for her uh, thoughtful consideration of our needs in assigning the, uh, the allocations. I want to thank uh, ranking member Kay Granger, always uh, supportive and a pleasure to work with, and all the members uh, of our subcommittee on both sides of the aisle. I'm pleased to report that we were able to accommodate more than 90% of member requests from both sides of the aisle, and most of you have cards in your hand which we've distributed which will give you the details on exactly what we were able to do. Uh, I hope we can continue to move forward on a bipartisan basis in a cooperative way as we seek to secure an agreement on overall budget uh, top line numbers. I'd also like to take a moment to thank the professional staff that work, us, work with us every step of the way. Our clerk, Joe Carlisle, and um, his minority count counterpart, Doug Disrude. They've done a fantastic job our T-HUD team also includes uh, Gladys Barcina, Willie Chang, Winnie Chang, I'm sorry, Joe Eckert, Sarah Puro, Angela Ohm, Becky Saleh. Also want to thank Sean Maxwell from my personal staff and uh, others who I, I might not have mentioned. We, we depend on lots of people to work long hours to, to produce this bill. This year's bill does represent a positive, inclusive approach for our country that will benefit all Americans. It includes $75.8 billion in discretionary funding, an increase of $4.7 billion over the 2019 enacted level, and $17.3 billion above the President's budget request. Uh, this allocation is certainly generous. We're grateful for it. But um, we still face tough trade-offs because um, <clears throat> we, we, were, we had some costs that, uh, that, that really we had to meet before we could think about uh, any kind of um, even incremental increases. We had um, $1 billion, for example, in inflation costs for, uh, for rental housing programs. We had $2 billion reduction in uh, offsetting FHA receipts. So we had to run to stay in place. Uh, uh, on part of this increased allocation, but it was sufficient to let us make uh, some meaningful additional investments in, in transportation and housing areas, of which I will give you some of the details uh, just, just now. 
Our full slate of hearings in the spring informed our approach. We heard testimony from a diverse array, diverse array of experts, witnesses on affordable housing production, on uh, climate resiliency, on fair housing enforcement, and on passenger rail development and uh, other key topics, a good hearing schedule. The questions from our subcommittee members and resulting discussion coupled with our traditional oversight hearings provided invaluable as we drafted this bill. What does this bill do? Does First and foremost, we're investing in infrastructure. Whatever is going on elsewhere in government, our bill is investing in infrastructure right here, right now. Transportation and housing infrastructure, infrastructure broadly conceived. We're in the nation, and we're as a nation are in the midst of an affordable housing crisis, and this bill dedicates new resources to address it. Section 8 vouchers are fully renewed. We increase funding for the home program by $500 million. We provide the community development block grant program with $300 million increase above last year's enacted level. The home funding alone translates to more than 30,000 additional units of affordable housing and will generate jobs and economic activity across this country. We also provide increased funding for public housing capital and operating expenses, including resources to address uh, carbon monoxide exposure, lead, and other emergency health hazards. Our renewed focus on affordable housing and community development does not come at the expense of um, the other half of our bill, transportation. On the contrary, the bill includes $1 billion for BUILD grants, former called the, uh, Tiber, formerly called the TIGER program, while maintaining parity between urban and rural BUILD awards. We continue the model established by this subcommittee in the last two fiscal years by providing $3 billion in additional discretionary resources for the FAST Act authorized levels for highways, transit, and aviation projects. This funding will benefit every state and territory in the country by making new projects possible or accelerating existing projects. Competitive rail programs like CRISI also are robustly funded, and Amtrak receives approximately $2 billion for the Northeast Corridor and the National Network. We also allocate additional resources for port infrastructure development and maritime programs. Finally, let me say that apart from these funding issues and our funding successes, we have some policy threads running throughout this bill, and I just want to highlight them <coughs> so, that, uh, so that we understand the importance of, uh, of each. First, safety. Safety. These investments have to be paired with renewed commitment to safety, and that applies to both transportation and housing, state and local partners, and industry. Rising accident rates on our nation's highways, the high-profile MAX-8 crashes, the deployment of autonomous systems across all modes, the lead and carbon monoxide hazards in our federally assisted housing, all of this requires to us to redouble our efforts and our focus on safety. So we're providing resources to and policy direction to address these uh, problems head on. For example, the bill increases the Federal Aviation Agency's safety office budget by 20 percent to ensure that we have enough inspectors, enough engineers, enough technicians to oversee the aircraft certification process and other vital safety functions. We provide additional rulemaking and enforcement resources to improve highway safety, and we dedicate $10 million to create a new highly autonomous systems safety sensor of excellence within USDOT. This center will bolster the department's in-house capacity to examine and audit and inspect and certify these complex systems across all modes. The second policy emphasis, vulnerable populations. Prioritizing assistance for vulnerable populations. Nearly $240 million is provided for construction of new housing units for the elderly and disabled. Programs serving veterans, the homeless, people with AIDS, domestic violence survivors, and youth aging out of foster care are robustly funded, including resources for new vouchers. Fair housing enforcement grants, housing counseling, and self-sufficiency programs also receive more resources. These programs are integral to ensuring all Americans have access to housing and can reach their full potential. The bill prohibits the department from repealing the equal access rule that protects LGBT people when they utilize housing services 
and it reinstates HUD's guidance to assist housing providers as they comply with this rule. The bill also prevents HUD from moving forward with its heartless proposal regarding mixed status families in federal subsidized housing. By the department's own admission, this plan would jeopardize the housing security of 55,000 children, all of whom are U.S. citizens or legal <laughs> residents. It's simply unacceptable. The final policy theme, resilience. Resilience, we talk about resilience in the context of disaster recovery. This bill anticipates increased emphasis on resilience across the entire array of housing and transportation programs, fully integrating resiliency principles into the full range of federal programs that fund transportation and community development. It requires HUD grantees, for example, to think about storms and other hazards as they utilize home and CDBG built, uh, funding. The Transportation Research Board is tasked with developing specifically resiliency metrics and performance standards for infrastructure projects. The bill also encourages all transportation and housing projects to use the most current building codes or engineering specifications during constructions. These provisions will help ensure that the federal government remains an active partner alongside states and local communities as they grapple with climate change and extreme weather. So, colleagues, this year's T-HUD bill makes forward-looking investments in our housing and transportation infrastructure while ensuring concerted attention to safety, to the needs of the most vulnerable, and to resilience. It'll benefit all American communities, urban and rural, and it lays a sound foundation for economic growth and development. I look forward to working with all of you and all of our House colleagues to enact this bill into law. Thank you, Madam Chair. I would now like to recognize the distinguished subcommittee ranking member, Mr. Diaz Ballard. Let me thank uh, the chairwoman, Chairwoman Lowy, for, uh, for bringing this bill again for us today and for her leadership uh, on the full committee. I also want to thank Ranking Member uh, Granger for her help, her leadership, and her assistance. Always been a particular in putting, down, in putting this bill together. Uh, and to you, Mr. Mr. Chairman, Chairman Price, uh, for really your friendship and your partnership. I will tell you I'm honored uh, to be, I am honored to be his ranking member. Um, I'm always impressed by his creative and thoughtful approach to legislating, uh, and he has treated, his, treated this as a partnership, and I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, for that. I also want to thank you for, um, you already mentioned the staff by name, thank you for doing that because they do an amazing job, so I want to echo uh, the Chairman's words. Chairman Price went out of his way to accommodate reasonable requests from both sides of the aisle. Uh, Look, obviously I might have made some different decisions here and there in the bill, but the chairman did a remarkable job uh, going through the program line by line, uh, program by program, and to craft a bill that addresses so many of our nation's priorities. I'm particularly grateful uh, for the funding, for example, he provided for ports infrastructure and for marine highways, uh, something that is a big priority of mine. Chris Sweet, who uh, you all know is my, my uh, legislative director, I mean, he spent so much time in ports recently that he could probably become a crane operator. Uh, this is something that is a huge, it's a huge priority for us. Uh, again, it's a huge priority of mine, and he has made sure that the program is funded so that we can build on the success that we achieved, um, again, with this new program in 2019. It was the first time that that program was funded. The chairman also continued to fund new investments in infrastructure, as he mentioned, including rail, transit, highways, airports, building on the $20 billion in investment that we made in this bill over the past two years. The bill also supports, also supports critical housing programs for the elderly, for the disabled, and yes, for our heroes, for our veterans. I'm particularly pleased that the Chairman Price continued a program that we began last year. It's called Mobility Vouchers, and it's to help families with children move into neighborhoods where, frankly, they have potential better job opportunities, a, a better, better schools, et cetera. Um, now, obviously, there, there are always going to be some differences, and there are some policy writers in this bill um, that, uh, that I and some of us object to. 
Uh, but again, I know that uh, the chairman and I will be able to work through these policy disagreements uh, as we have in the last four years when I chaired the subcommittees. As a matter of fact, we'll have a few amendments, a couple of amendments, to deal with some of those uh, policy riders uh, as, as the debate goes on. Now, having said that, we all know that the, the major hurdle uh, that stands in the way of progress on this legislation, <laughs> like on the rest of the appropriations bills, is the fact that we don't have a top level, top number, a number budget agreement between the House and Senate that can be signed by the President. So uh, that's something that you've, we've heard time and time again. Uh, this is a good bill, but again, unfortunately, the numbers that it's built on are artificial numbers. Now, we are blessed in this committee to have the leadership of Chairman Lowy and Ranking Member Granger, uh, who I am convinced, if folks will just get out of their way, uh, they'll be able to agree, reach an agreement on that top line number. Uh, I remind folks around there that they were instrumental in ending the shutdown in February. Uh, and that I know that if uh, they're given the opportunity to, to get together and, and kind of lock themselves in a room without outside interference, um, they'll have an agreement in, in short order. Again, I'm confident that this bill, which is so critical to our economy and our communities, can move forward quickly uh, with bipartisan support once that deal, that top line number deal is struck. Uh, I'll close again by thanking Chairman Price for his friendship. He's become a partner, but also a friend, a trusted friend. Uh, and again, for so many of the smart, good decisions that he made in this bill. With that, Madam Chairwoman, I yield back. I'd now like to recognize myself and thank, again, Chairman Price, Ranking Member Diaz-Ballard for your work on this bill. And I also thank the outstanding staff for your efforts. House Democrats continue our work for the people with the fiscal year 2020 Transportation, Housing, and Urban Development Bill, which focuses on improving public health and safety, protecting the traveling public, and enhancing our infrastructure, and investing in our communities so that every American has a shot at a better life. The Department of Transportation should prioritize safety, and this bill would equip the department to fund safety upgrades on our roads and rails, as well as safety research. This bill increases funding to make rail grade crossings more safe, an issue that is so important to my constituents and to many of your constituents but in Rockland and Westchester counties, this has been <coughs> incredibly important. The bill would provide adequate funding for the federal share of one of the most important transportation projects in our country to advance computer, commuter safety and the economy, the gateway tunnel between New Jersey and New York. It's time for the administration to put politics aside and fund this vital initiative. In addition to continuing work to solve persistent risks, such as impaired driving and transportation of energy products, this bill also seeks to address the challenges of tomorrow, like those associated with transporting LNG by rail and with highly autonomous vehicles and with report language encouraging construction projects to integrate resiliency, the bill would help to mitigate <coughs> the impacts of climate change. Housing is the foundation on which lives are built. It is nearly impossible to go to school, get a job, raise a family, or age in place without a stable place to live. Yesterday, Congress took a critical step for disaster-stricken communities by passing a $19.1 billion disaster relief package. This bill builds on that work with $6 million for permanent disaster recovery staff, not contractors, to administer HUD's $80 billion CDBGD portfolio. Robust investments in the bill, such as increases to CDBG, home, 
led in healthy homes would make our communities healthier and safer. Additional salaries and staffing resources would enable HUD to fully implement the Violence Against Women Act and critical language would protect the most vulnerable, including undocumented individuals and their U.S. citizen children and LGBTQ youth against eviction. With this bill, we have the opportunity to invest in our infrastructure and fundamentally improve the lives of our constituents. I urge support. And I'd now like to recognize Ranking Member Granger for her opening remarks. Thank you, Madam Chair. I want to recognize Chairman Price and Ranking Member D.S. Ballard for their leadership <clears throat> in developing the Transportation, Housing, and Urban Development Bill. This bill continues many of the infrastructure investments that were made possible by the budget caps agreement for the past two fiscal years. This includes investments such as bill grants for innovative transportation projects, airport grants, highway upgrades, and port infrastructure improvements. These investments not only support the safety and quality of life of the traveling public, they also promote economic growth through reducing congestion and facilitating commerce. I'm pleased to see targeted investments in housing for the elderly, the disabled, and veterans, as well as strong support for community development block grants. I do have some serious concerns about some of the riders that are included. The trucking-related provisions in the bill restrict the ability of the Department of Transportation to protect interstate commerce and ensure public security and safety. DOT is prevented from modifying vehicle fuel efficiency standards, which would harm consumers in our auto industry. DOT is also pro prohibited from recovering taxpayer funds from the failed California high-speed rail project. We must work together to improve this bill by eliminating these riders, but my greatest concern is what you've heard from me before, and that's the majority has written the appropriations bill to an unrealistic top-line funding. I finally found something I can agree with with Mr. Diaz Villart, <laughs> and that's Mrs. Lowy that you and I could solve this <laughs> if we got together. <laughs> In closing, I want to recognize all the members of the subcommittee for their work. I also want to thank all the staff, from my staff, Doug Disrude, uh, Sean Dillon, and Alyssa Hinman. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I yield back. Are there any other members wishing to make general comments? Hmm? Ms. Kapsa. Oh, Ms. Kapsa. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I first want to congratulate Chairman Price and Ranking Member diaz Ballart for their hard work on this bill. Transportation and housing are at the center of promoting a healthy and growing economy, and the chairman's mark fits the bill. I would like to thank the committee for providing $40 million for the St. Lawrence Seaway Development Corporation, Commerce Through the Seaway, and on the Great Lakes generates about $25 billion annually in economic activity and supports more than 147,000 jobs in the eight Great Lakes states. This bill also provides competitive funding for a relatively new port infrastructure program. Ports across our nation need a new generation of investment to keep domestic industry competitive, especially in view of very stiff foreign competition. Congress is watching this new program closely to ensure these dollars are competitively and fairly awarded. I also want to thank the chairman and ranking member for inclu inclusion of report language that would increase coordination between the Department of Housing and Urban Development and the Department of Energy weatherization activities. Effective interagency cooperation is far too rare, so I'm pleased to see <coughs> these efforts to strengthen collaboration to allow Americans, more Americans, to weatherize their homes to achieve better human health as well as energy savings. And I'm especially grateful uh, to the chairman and ranking member for inclusion of a feasibility study to pair together housing and mental health services. Stable housing is central to health and well-being, and this is particularly true for those with serious mental illness who cycle through a vicious and expensive revolving door in hospitals, shelters, jails, and then again and again and again in that vicious cycle at great cost to the public. This study will be critical to understanding how we can authorize a new program uh, to meet this great need. And finally, I'm pleased to see $803 million in new construction for housing for the elderly. It is desperately needed across our country, surely in my district. 
to provide housing to needy elderly individuals who have given so much to our society over the years. Again, I thank the chair and ranking member for these important investments, and I yield back and support the bill. Ms. Lee. First of all, I, too, want to... Uh, thank Chairman Price and our ranking member uh, Diaz Billard for your tremendous leadership in working together in a bipartisan way on, the, on this very important bill. The bill makes uh, critical investments in our roads, bridges, and infrastructure through our Department of Transportation. But I'm also pleased to see, most notably, the large increase of $5.9 billion for all HUD programs. As the chair mentioned, we do have an affordable crisis throughout the country and many in many of our districts quite frankly we are experiencing a state of emergency the 12 billion increase for tenant based rental assistance and the 843 million increase for project based rental assistance will help millions of families rent safe decent and quality homes these subsidized programs will help us reach more extremely low-income households and hopefully continue to keep families housed. This important bill includes $500 million increase for the Home Investment <coughs> Program, which is the only federal housing program exclusively focused on addressing affordability. This much-needed increase will help communities like mine in Alameda County, which is experiencing this housing emergency. I'm also pleased to see $164 million increase to the Homeless Assistance Grants, which is, which is important to improving access to housing and providing permanent supportive housing programs for families, for veterans, and those who are chronically homeless. This is especially true in California, where the homeless count is about 130,000 families. The $17 million increase for housing opportunities for people with AIDS, which is the only federal program dedicated to the housing needs of people living with AIDS, this is greatly appreciated, Mr. Chair. But it's not just the programmatic funding alone. This bill includes critical report and bill language to ensure the department helps more families succeed. For instance, I'd like to, again, thank the chair and our ranking member for including very important report language in this bill, including the fair market rent assessment. This is an issue that is of deep concern to my district and to many districts, as the data used to calculate fair market rents are not adequate for ra rapidly rising rents throughout the country, and especially, again, in my district in Alameda County. Uh, many um, individuals are at risk of being evicted because the rent subsidies are too low. So I thank you for including this report language and the study that's extremely important uh, of alternative methods for calculating FMM, FMRs. That's what this uh, fair market rate rental study is called. And I look forward to HUD uh, producing this report. Finally, let me just thank the chair uh, for including the language on 10 20, 30 and high poverty census tracts in this bill that will not only provide important study on the percentage of funding that has been directed to persistent <laughs> poverty counties and high poverty areas over the last three fiscal years, but it also creates a set aside for national infrastructure investment and transit infrastructure grants for persistent poverty jurisdictions. So thank you again, Mr. Chair, for this bill. Uh, I tell you, the housing crisis, it is an emergency throughout the country. Um, again, I have to just say housing should be a basic human right that we should all embrace. And so this bill really begins to put us on the track to make sure that everyone has access to safe, decent, and affordable housing. Thank you again. Mr. Quigley is recognized. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, as vice chair of the THUD subcommittee, I want to thank the chairman and um, the ranking member for their great work on this bill. This is a good bill. Uh, it provides funding for our nation's transit systems and encourages an emphasis on transit accessibility. It increases investments in Amtrak and other passenger rail systems that are crucial to Chicago and millions of Americans across the country and highlights that on-time performance is key to maintaining a successful and reliable system. This bill promotes aviation safety while helping to address noise impacts on the communities that surround airports like O'Hare in my district. On the housing side, the chairman has worked to help address funding deficiencies that have gotten in the way of help for the most vulnerable among us. The bill contains a 40% bump for the home program 
and a funding increase for CDBG. It increases funding for housing programs for the elderly and disabled and allocates $100 million for the Youth Homelessness Demonstration Program. Crucially, this bill steps up where this administration's HUD refuses to and includes protections for homeless LGBT youth. I'm proud of those protections and I'm proud of this bill. Thank you. Mr. Cuellar is recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair. I want to thank you and your ranking member, uh, Ms. Granger, and certainly I want to thank Mr. Price, uh, Mr. Price and his staff for the uh, great work that they did on this uh, particular uh, bill on transportation and HUD and the other um, uh, areas, and certainly the ranking member, I want to thank him uh, for his work also, and again, the staff. Uh, I just want to point out two things uh, that are important. I, uh, the other things have been highlighted. First of all, I want to say thank you, for uh, Mr. Chairman, for the uh, funding that you added uh, for uh, transportation and the CDBG <laughs> home. I know that you provided an area that shows, a uh, chart that shows how much money every particular state is getting. Uh, I would like to emphasize the uh, state of Texas that will get an additional $138 million, and I want to say thank you for that highway and transit uh, funding that you're providing extra to the state of Texas, and certainly for the city, uh, CDBG and home, an additional $55 million. And members, if you haven't seen the chart, I would ask you to take a look at it. It's, uh, it's a way that provides us an idea what each state is, is getting. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the second thing I want to emphasize is the border infrastructure coordinator, which is extremely important. The border handles, uh, and I'll use Laredo as an example, we handle over 16, now it's 16,000 trailers a day. Uh, we're now the, not, not only the largest inland port, but the largest port uh, in the country. Uh, and a lot of this trade uh, has to do, when it comes in, you've got to have uh, some sort of coordination between GSA, CBP, and the Department of Transportation. What this does for the first time, and I want to thank the chairman for doing this, it would allow the, all those three agencies to sit down and, and put together a border infrastructure coordinator, so that way CBP is not doing one thing, Department of Transportation is doing one thing, and certainly GSA is doing another thing. This way they put all the efforts together. They focus on the efficiencies uh, of getting that infrastructure done in a faster way. In, a, in addition, you also ask them to work with their counterpart because we cannot be one-dimensional and say that everything starts in the middle of the uh, bridge, uh, a international bridge. So you ask that they coordinate with the Mexican side to make sure that their infrastructure and our infrastructure is coordinated and make sure we handle, uh, and as you know, land ports handle over 80% of all the trade that comes into the United States. So for the extra funding, Mr. Chairman, and, 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 and the members of the subcommittee, and certainly for, uh, we say thank you, and for the border infrastructure coordinator, I say thank you so much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Aguilar is recognized. Thank you, Chairwoman Lowy. Uh, I just wanted to thank uh, the chairman and the, and the ranking member uh, for inclusion and some uh, language uh, that will help guide FHA loan limits uh, in high growth regions uh, like we have in the West. Uh, the inclusion of this language uh, will be very helpful to, to constituencies across the country. I want to thank uh, the chairman and the ranking member for working uh, with me uh, on this issue, uh, and I look forward to continuing to work with HUD to make sure that FHA loan limits uh, are reflective, uh, are truly reflective of the high growth regions uh, that we have. Uh, thanks so much, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Torres is recognized. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I also want to join my colleagues in thanking uh, Chairman Price and Ranking Member diaz Ballard for their leadership on the bill uh, before us. The bill not only uh, does a lot for our nation's infrastructure and housing needs through its bold investments, it also does a lot for Southern California. And I'm especially grateful for the inclusion of several requests which are important to my constituents, many of which have already been um, spoken about. I am pleased uh, to have worked with the chair to include language that directs the Department of Transportation to provide support to recipients of federal funding to ensure communication with public and private utility providers when planning transportation projects. This language puts us one step closer to realizing a highway of things. 
uh, where public and private entities coordinate on transit planning and share the cost of establishing essential services like broadband, water, and electricity. The goal here is to dig once. Um, Madam Chair, when it comes to ensuring that housing is affordable, we are putting our money right uh, where our mouth is. This bill includes robust funding increases for affordable housing programs, including $23.8 billion for rental assistance programs. It also provides more than $45 million for housing for homeless veterans. The bill also includes a provision that I fought for that incorporates manufacturer housing into the department's affordable housing strategies. This is particularly important in districts like mine, where the median in uh, home value, uh, my constituents could only afford around 25% of the homes that are, are for sale in my district. And finally, I'm proud that this bill is significantly uh, has new investments in infrastructure and housing in ways that prioritize safety and protect the most vulnerable among us. In California, my constituents do not have the luxury of ignoring our, our crumbling infrastructure and increasingly expensive housing markets. And Chairman Price, I am <coughs> glad that you did not ignore those issues either. Thank you once again uh, to all of you uh, for working so hard to deliver uh, this bill, and I yield back. Mrs. Lawrence is recognized. I want to thank uh, Chairman Price and you, Chairwoman Loy, for this amazing uh, 2020 thud funding bill. I'm thrilled to see that the committee included robust funding for programs that invest in our nation's crumbling infrastructure, such as the Bill Grant Program. The bill also prioritized funding for aviation professionals, including $10 million in total funding for the aviation workforce development and maintenance technician development. The inclusion of $4.6 million for the small and disadvantaged business utilization, which supports the Women and Girls in Transportation Initiative, presents a great opportunity to develop careers in the transportation industry. This bill also strengthens our community and protects our constituents by increasing funding for critical HUD programs for assistance to low-income family and first home-time buyers. Today, ladies and gentlemen, you'll see a lot of young people on the Hill, and it is Foster Care Shadow Day on the Hill. And we'll see members of Congress with these amazing young, young people. I'm so proud to say as vice chair of the, of the foster care caucus for Congress that the committee recognizes the challenges faced by vulnerable youth ex exiting the foster care system who face significantly higher risk of experiencing homelessness, <clears throat> domestic violence, and sex trafficking, and that the committee encourages HUD to ensure that the continuing of care program continues to address all populations, including youth who have aged out of the foster care system. And I just want to say that we, again, have so much work to do, and I'm very proud to be in support of this bill. Mr. Serrano is recognized. Thank you. I'll be brief. Of course, I want to thank uh, the chairman and the uh, ranking member and the full committee for... Uh, the help that goes to uh, my state of New York. But I heard something in the uh, chairman's opening statement, which is something I've been working on for many years. And Mr. Calber and Mr. Simpson know about this. And that's when you referred to us, you said the states and the territories. And if that's something that I continuously re try to remind us of, that the family is larger. But it wasn't only the language, which I hope changes. It's also the numbers indicate that. We did it yesterday on the House floor with the Supplemental Disaster Bill, and we do it here today. So thank you for helping us change the language. Ms. Roybell Allard. 
Uh, I rise in strong support of the fiscal year 2020 transportation, housing, and HUD development bill. And I'm glad to see that this bill fully invests in our homes and communities. It fully funds Section 202 housing for the elderly, adding almost $160 million more than the President's request. And it soundly rejects the President's attempt to eliminate critical programs like the Home Investment Partnership Program, Section 4 Capacity Building, the Self-Help owner Home Ownership Opportunity Program, and the Community Development Block Grants. I'm also glad to see that this bill would prevent two disgraceful HUD rules from going into effect. First, it would block the administration from changing second, Section 214 of the Housing and Community Development Act to prohibit mixed status families from living in subsidized housing. Federal assistance is already prorated to eligible residents, so ineligible immigrants do not receive a benefit. If implemented, this immoral rule would take housing security away from thousands of individuals, many from California. Second, this bill would prevent HUD from denying housing assistance to individuals based on their gender identity. An estimated one in five transgender individuals have experienced homelessness at some point in their lives. Entrenching discrimination against them as they seek shelter and stability is horrendous, and I am proud that this bill would block those actions. For these reasons and so many more, I thank Chairman David Price and Chairwoman Nita Lowy, and I urge my colleagues to vote yes on the passage of the FY Thud Appropriations Bill. I yield back. Ms. Bustos is recognized. Thank you, Chairman Lowy. Also, I want to thank uh, Chairman Price and uh, also Ranking Member, member uh, diaz Bellart for the, your work on this important bill. Thank you very much. Um, and I know uh, Congresswoman Lawrence already recognized the fact that this is Foster Youth Day. I've actually got two foster youth here with me, um, and, I, and I would like to recognize them and ask them to stand so we could all thank them uh, for being here and drawing to our attention. It's Kirsten and Josiah. They're right there. So thanks for both of you for being here. Thanks, everybody. I really appreciate that. Um, now I'll get back to the, uh, the matter at, uh, it, that we're talking about. Um, as a former member of the Transportation Infrastructure Committee, a lot of programs funded in this bill hold a special place for me. And given the current state of our airports, our highways, bridges, and railroads, I'm pleased about the investment this bill makes in our infrastructure. I especially appreciate the inclusion of report language I requested to urge the Federal Railroad Administration to grant a multi-year extension mm -hmm of funds for a planned rail service between Chicago and the Quad Cities. This project is so important to the economic development of the district that I am fortunate enough to serve. I was also glad to see funding for the aircraft pilot and aviation maintenance workforce development programs that I helped authorize when I was a member of the TNI committee. Uh, these funds will help ensure that our aviation needs are safely met while helping to provide good paying jobs in communities like Rockford, Illinois. On the housing side, the bill makes important investment in the Rural Housing Stability Assistance Programs. I thank the committee for recognizing the unique issues facing rural populations at risk of homelessness, and I hope that the Department of Housing and Urban De Development move forward on providing these grants. Finally, I think that we've all become very aware in the last few years of just how important it is to have clean water. This report includes language directing the Secretary of Housing and Urban Development to establish a pilot program to help state and local governments identify and address sources of lead in drinking water in federally assisted housing. The department must do more to protect families in federally assisted housing, and such a pilot program will help ensure the, their access to safe drinking water. With that, I yield back. Thank you, Madam Chair. Ms. Clark is recognized. Thank you, Chairwoman Lowy, and thank you to Chairman Price and Ranking Member diaz Ballard, um, the subcommittee staff, and all my colleagues on this committee for this great bill. As a member of the T-Head subcommittee, I am proud of the bill and the resources it will provide to our nation's infrastructure and protections for vulnerable populations. I truly appreciate the emphasis and focus on resiliency. This is something that communities in my <clears throat> district and around the country will benefit from. And I associate myself with all the comments of my colleagues, but a special thanks and gratitude for the dedicated additional resources for survivors of domestic violence. 
survivors of domestic violence, dating violence, sexual assault, stalking, and trafficking are so vulnerable to homelessness. The $50 million set aside for the Continuum of Care program and the additional $10 million for HUD to carry out and implement the housing provisions within VAWA will go so far to improving the lives of those who have survived domestic violence. Thank you for this bill. Thank you for your work, and thank you for the time. Seeing no other members wishing to make opening remarks, I'd like to recognize Mr. Price to offer a manager's amendment. The clerk will read the amendment. Price thought number one. I ask that the uh, reading of the amendment be dispensed with. Mr. Price is recognized. This is an, uh, a manager's amendment that includes a handful of technical and non- <laughs> This is a manager's amendment, which uh, includes a handful of technical and uh, non-controversial items. They've been agreed to by the minority, so I ask that all members support the amendment. Ranking Member Diaz-Ballard is recognized. Madam Chairwoman, uh, Mr. Stewart always reminds us to be uh, quick, so I will support the amendment. I yield back. Are there any other members who wish to be heard on the amendment? I recognize Mr. Price for one minute to close. Thank Mr. Diaz, Ballard, and, and many members who had um, who had items uh, they were uh, concerned to include in this amendment. I appreciate everyone's cooperation and uh, work together, and uh, I believe we have an amendment we can all support. And I ask that you do so. Thank you. The question is on the amendment. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed say no. In the opinion, in the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it, and the amendment is adopted. Are there any further amendments? For what purpose does the member from Arkansas rise? Hello, hello. There we go. It's a little slow to react. It's uh, early in the week for these microphones. Um, <laughs> Madam Chair, I have an amendment at the desk and uh, seek unanimous consent that it be considered as read. The member from Arkansas is recognized for five minutes on the amendment. I thank the chairwoman. First, I'd like to commend our subcommittee chair and ranking member uh, for all their hard work uh, that they've done on this bill. The investments in transportation and infrastructure <clears throat> make a real difference in our communities. But, Madam Chair, I'll, I rise to offer this amendment with uh, my friend Mr. Cuellar of Texas to strike three riders that would place an unacceptable burden on the trucking industry, which, as everyone in this room knows, uh, carries a lot of uh, our economy on the, uh, in the trailers of these trucks across our country. They'll do real harm. These riders uh, will do real harm to our economy. The first rider prohibits the DOT from establishing uniform hours of service rules for truckers Instead, each state would be free to set their own hours of service requirements. Just think about a patchwork system like this and the disruption to the supply chain. The second rider would require DOT to publish trucking company safety violations. Sounds like a good idea. Based on data that has been determined by both the GAO and the National Academy of Sciences to be flawed. That's not such a good idea. Congress understood this data was flawed. And the FAST Act required the data to be taken down and the system reevaluated. DOT is taking GAOs and the National Academy's recommendations into account and implementing a corrective action plan and developing a new scoring system for trucking company violations. This rider disregards congressional intent, forces DOT to report violations based on flawed data. And the third rider prohibits any changes to current 30-minute rest break rules and freezes an inflexible requirement in place. Last year, DOT solicited input from stakeholders on reasonable changes to this rule, especially given new requirements for truckers to electronically log their hours. Madam Chair, I believe it's reasonable to provide flexibility to truckers, especially where it will improve safety. For example, Changes could be considered that reduce the number of trucks parked on the shoulder of roads because of this rest break requirement. And haulers of agricultural products, important in my district, need accommodations to haul livestock safely and humanely. 
I urge adoption of the amendment to remove unacceptable burdens on the trucking companies in all of our districts, and I yield back the balance of my time. Mr. Cuellar, a co-sponsor of the, of the amendment, is recognized. Yes, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And, and first of all, I, I want to thank uh, my colleague from Arkansas uh, for sponsoring this uh, 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 amendment or this writer, proposed writer. Uh, before I start, I, I just want to say, uh, Madam Chair, I want to thank uh, Chairman Price and his staff because we did try to uh, come up with some language. I think there were like three different proposals. So I do want to say thank you. Uh, I know we tried, and I hope that we continue to get to a place as the process gets there to keep working on it. Uh, so I, I just want to make sure that everybody knows that we did try to come up with some uh, language, and I want to thank the chairman and staff. Um, you know, the basic question is very simple here, and if somebody can answer this question, I'll sit down. Uh, regulatory authority over interstate and international commerce is constitutionally held by a federal regulators. If somebody can tell me why different states can put in the different patchwork, especially when we have supply chains, let's say you have something coming in from Laredo, and then you go up to Arkansas uh, or decide to go to Oklahoma or different states, and imagine uh, the supply chain. And keep in mind that 40% uh, of, uh, of things coming in from Mexico, as an example, uh, is, are American parts. So you have a supply chain. So imagine if you are coming in and have one patchwork in one state, another patchwork in another state, another patchwork in another state, what's going to happen to the efficiency of that supply chain? So my question is, if somebody can't answer when they start speaking against this, Regulatory authority on interstate and international commerce constitutionally is held by the regulators. And somebody can tell me why a state has can preempt the state, then I'll sit down at that particular time. But again, I think we know what the Constitution calls. So basically what we're asking is that this uh, amendments, uh, they, they, they threaten the critical role of the U.S. Department of Transportation ensuring the safe movement of interstate commerce uh, on this. And what we're asking is to make sure that we don't undermine the efficient transportation of U.S. commerce and goods along our interstate uh, highways. Uh, again, uh, Madam Chair, uh, and I know we're going to hear who's on the other side, right. but I think on, on, on this side, whether it's the trucking companies, and I think in Laredo I'll probably have more trucking companies than anybody in the whole country. Uh, 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 trucking companies, we uh, also have freight forwarders. Uh, we also have shippers. We also have agricultural interests involved and so many other folks except for the folks uh, that we mentioned. So, again, uh, Madam Chair, I, I respectfully uh, get up because, uh, again, I want to thank the chairman. I have a lot of respect for the chairman and his staff. I know we tried it, and I... Uh, would ask that we continue working on this issue because this issue is not going to go away. It's not going to go away. So I'm hoping that down the line we can come up to some sort of uh, consensus on this. And with that, I say thank you uh, for your time. Chairman Price is recognized. Madam Chair, I rise in opposition to the amendment. Uh, this amendment would strike three provisions in our bill that are aimed at ensuring the safety of truck drivers, bus drivers, and the general public. Section 135 of our bill prohibits DOT from preempting or eliminating meal and rest breaks for drivers, for truckers. Section 134 of our bill requires DOT to post comprehensive data about the safety of motor carriers. And Section 135 prohibits DOT from eliminating the 30-minute meal and rest break from federal hours of service requirement. Now, each of these provisions uh, addresses different aspects of truck safety, but the bottom line is that they do address truck safety, and they have drawn support from a wide array of safety organizations. <clears throat> they have support from an array of labor organizations. They have support from small and independent trucking companies, all of whom oppose the amendment before us. The provision in the base bill provisions would ensure existing meal and rest breaks remain in place while the courts consider the issue of preemption and while the authorizing committees have the opportunity to weigh in through FAST Act reauthorization. In other words, no preemptory moves by, uh, by, by the administration short of those, um, the, the, the consideration that's underway 
in those, um, in those settings. Uh, we're dealing with a major issue here. Fatal crashes involving large trucks and buses are increasing. We saw an increase of 10% in 2017 in these crashes, and they're up a shocking 40% since 2009. Earlier this year, the administration overturned longstanding precedent and preempted California's meal and rest break law, reversing 80 years of worker protections and leaving truck drivers more vulnerable to long hours and abusive working conditions. The agency is now considering doing the same thing in Washington state. Because trucking interests have been unsuccessful lobbying Congress for a broad nationwide prohibition on meal and rest breaks, they've instead used a state-by-state -state approach. State laws mandating meal and rest breaks were specifically designed to reduce worker fatigue and to protect workers and the public from workplace accidents, injuries, and deaths. In most cases, these breaks are no more than a 10-minute rest break or a half-hour break for lunch. And what about the issue of data? The data collected by DOT as part of the Compliance, Safety, Accountability Enforcement Program has been determined to be sound in a study completed by the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine. So we have an obligation to share that crucial safety data with the general public. Without public data, there are insufficient incentives for unsafe carriers to improve their operations. So I urge colleagues to uh, reject this amendment. Mrs. Granger is recognized. I rise to support the amendment. The gentleman's amendment strikes three provisions in the bill that would cause serious harm to the trucking industry. As Mr. Womack has explained so well, language in this bill would stand in the way of DOT exercising its proper authority to regulate interstate commerce and establish reasonable safety regulations. I'm concerned about the impact of these provisions on businesses in the state of Texas and across the nation. Many of the affected trucking companies would be small family-owned businesses. I thank the gentleman for offering the amendment and I urge a yes vote. Mrs. Torres is recognized. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and I rise in reluctant opposition to this amendment. Uh, my opposition is reluctant um, for two reasons. Number one, I do not have a copy of this amendment as it was filed. I do have a report um, that was provided by the committee, but I do not have a filed amendment. So it would be great if the minority can provide that for us. I also share the concern that, that we ensure that truckers can safely comply with the regulations that we set. For example, the area that I represent does not have nearly enough rest areas for trucks to safely stop when they are required to stop. And because of congestion, it might take a trucker eight hours to complete a 100-mile round trip. I am opposed to this amendment because keeping our constituents safe must be our number one priority. Large truck crashes kill thousands of Americans every single year, and driver fatigue is the leading cause. We have to make sure that we do everything in our power to protect the safety of truck drivers and every American <clears throat> that drives on our highways. The risk is simply too great. Lives are too precious, and our constituents and their families deserve better. I also would, like, would be remiss if I did not stand up for the right of the people of my state of California to govern themselves. The courts have already said that the California law is a labor law. Meal breaks are a labor law issue. And therefore, it cannot be preempted. So I hope that as we move forward with this provision or not, that we would work together on a bipartisan way to address some of the concerns voiced today. I oppose this amendment today, 
in its current form, and I urge my colleagues to do the same and do right by the commuters that have to share the highway with truckers, and they need the rest. And I yield back. Mr. Cartwright is recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> I rise uh, to thank Chairman Price for his emphasis on highway safety and protecting Americans on our highways in this country. And I pose this amendment because it does exactly the opposite of keeping our American brothers and sisters safe. In 2017, 4,102 Americans died in tractor-trailer crashes. 82% of those people who were not operating the tractor-trailer itself. We're talking about rigs that weigh up to a total of 80,000 pounds, that require extra braking distance, uh, extra time to anticipate braking. Uh, this, is, this is complicated work for a truck driver, and the last thing we want to do is cut down on rest brakes and meal brakes and chances for truck drivers to catch up on their sleep. At a time when car fatalities have been consistently declining in this nation, Truck accidents resulting in fatalities have been increasing for the last 10 years. In fact, 2017 was the highest number of truck fatalities in 10 years in this country. We're getting worse at this, not better. Now is not the time to cut back on safety rules and regulations. And remember, according to the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety, truck driver fatigue is a known crash risk. Now, Chairman Price just, I'm going to quote him, he just said something. He said, he's talking about the long hours and abusive working conditions. He's talking about the abusive, abusive working conditions placed on truck drivers. Truck drive, why is that? How could that be? Because truck drivers in this country get paid by the mile. They are put in the position by their employers and by the dispatchers to try to make their money catch as catch can between loads and what ends up happening is that they get put under intense pressure to to drive too long to drive when they haven't had enough sleep to drive when they're fatigued and to drive when they're in a condition to place americans in danger who are in the path of these eighty thousand pound rigs for us to do things like stop gathering and publishing data on trucking fatalities it's hard for me to believe that somebody would raise an amendment like this. I come from northeastern Pennsylvania, where all kinds of interstate highways converge, and we are on the, we are on the silk route from, from Florida to, to uh, uh, New York and New England and, and Canada, and from the east-west, from California to New York. All of these trucks come right through our area, so we see this. This is not theoretical. These are not just statistics. These are my friends and my neighbors neighbors who are placed at risk when they're in front of these trucks. Let's not let truck drivers drive fatigued. Let's oppose this amendment. I yield back. If there is no further debate, the member from Arkansas is recognized on the amendment for oh, one minute. Mr. Diaz Oh, Mr. Madam Diaz Chair, I want to just very brief. I just want to make sure that folks that the, 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 all the amendments, including this final amendment, was were passed out. So they should be on your desk. That I yield back. Thank you. If there is no further debate or comment, the member from Arkansas is recognized on the amendment for one minute to close. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. And boy, to, to listen to the other side talk, you would think that this amendment was purposed in just creating danger for everybody traveling our roads and highways. Actually, what we're saying is that a patchwork system would be a terrible, terrible disruption to the supply chain, as has already been mentioned. And the data that we're talking about was flawed data. I won't go through the, what, I, what I said before uh, the debate started, but the fact is that DOT is a responsible agency and can uh, address those uh, matters. I, I would just simply ask my colleagues to think about the fact that this is going to be a terrible hardship, is a terrible hardship, on a <laughs> lot of trucking organizations to include, and perhaps more so, the small family-owned, independent sort of trucking businesses. They would be the most severely hit. Uh, so I urge adoption of this common-sense amendment to strike these three provisions out of the bill and uh, yield back the balance of my time. The question is on the amendment offered by the member from Arkansas. All those in favor say aye. Aye. 
Those opposed say no. No. In the opinion of the chair, the noes have it. A recorded vote has been requested. All those in favor of a recorded vote, raise your hand. A sufficient number being in support, a recorded vote is ordered. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Adderholt. Mr. Adderholt, aye. Mr. Aguilar. No. Mr. Aguilar, no. Mr. Amade. Mr. Bishop. No. Mr. Bishop, no. Mrs. Bustos. No. Mrs. Bustos, no. Mr. Calvert. Aye. Mr. Calvert, aye. Mr. Carter. Aye. Mr. Carter, aye. Mr. Cartwright. No. Mr. Cartwright, no. Mr. Case. No. Mr. Case, no. Ms. Clark. Ms. Clark, no. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole, aye. Mr. Christ. Mr. Christ, no. Mr. Cuellar. Mr. Cuellar, aye. Mr. Loro. Mr. Loro, no. Mr. diaz Ballard. Mr. diaz Ballard, aye. Mr. Fleischman. Mr. Fleischman, aye. Mr. Fortenberry. Mr. Fortenberry, aye. Ms. Frankel. Ms. Frankel, no. Ms. Granger. Ms. Granger, aye. Mr. Graves. Mr. Graves, aye. Dr. Harris. Dr. Harris, aye. Mr. Rear Butler. Mr. Hurd. Mr. Hurd, aye. Mr. Joyce. Mr. Joyce, aye. Ms. Captor. No. Ms. Captor, no. Mr. Kilmer. Mr. Kilmer, no. Mrs. Kirkpatrick. Mrs. Kirkpatrick, no. Mrs. Lawrence. Mrs. Lawrence, no. Ms. Lee. Ms. Lee, no. Mrs. Lowy. No. Mrs. Lowy, no. Ms. McCollum. Ms. McCollum, no. Ms. Ming. Ms. Ming, no. Mr. Molinar. Mr. Molinar, aye. Mr. Newhouse. Mr. Newhouse. Mr. Palazzo. Mr. Palazzo, aye. Ms. Pingree. Ms. Pingree, no. Mr. Pocan. Mr. Pocan, no. Mr. Price. No. Mr. Price, no. Mr. Quigley. Mr. Quigley, no. Mrs. Roby. Mrs. Roby, I, Mr. Rogers. Mr. Rogers, I, Ms. Robo Allard. Ms. Robo Allard, no. Mr. Rubisberger. Mr. Rubisberger, no. Mr. Rutherford. Mr. Rutherford, I, Mr. Ryan. Mr. Ryan, no. Mr. Serrano. Mr. Serrano, no. Mr. Simpson. Mr. Simpson, I, Mr. Stewart. Mr. Stewart, I, Mrs. Torres. Mrs. Torres, no. Mr. Visklosky. Mr. Visklosky, no. Ms. Wasserman Schultz. Ms. Wasserman Schultz, no. Mrs. Watson Coleman. Mrs. Watson Coleman, no. Mr. Womack. Mr. Womack, I. Does any member wish to record their vote or change their vote? Mr. Newhouse. Mr. Newhouse. Mr. Newhouse, aye. Uh, seeing none, except for the one, the clerk will tally. <clears throat> On this vote, the ayes are 22 and the nays are 29. The amendment is not adopted. Uh, for Madam what Chair, purpose does the member from Idaho rise? Madam Chair, I have an amendment at the desk, <clears throat> and I ask unanimous consent that it be considered as read. Without objection, the reading of the amendment is dispensed with. The member from Idaho is recognized for five minutes on the amendment. I thank the gentleman. This amendment strikes a provision that unreasonably limits DOT's ability to pull back funds from the California high-speed rail project. Now, this project has been troubled for many years. It has failed to meet milestone after milestone after milestone. And after years of missed deadlines, the state of California itself decided to reduce the project from the original plan to go from San Francisco to Los Angeles. The new plan reduces the route from Merced to Bakersfield through the Central Valley of California. And even this segment, segment is behind schedule. It was supposed to be completed in 2022, but DOT has determined it will miss that deadline. The project has also failed to achieve its promised contributions from the state of California. For example, just last December, High Speed Rail, Rail <laughs> Authority committed $142 million state contribution, $142 million in state contributions to advance the final design. But the grant only reported for, the grantee only reported 48 million in state contributions that month. The writer in this bill intends to tie these funds up for years by prohibiting DOT from making these funds available for any other purpose if there is any pending litigation of any kind, and including requirements that any new grantee that could be impossible to meet. As members of Congress, and especially of this committee. We should insist that agencies under our jurisdictions pull back funds from failed projects so that they can be put to better use. This seems like the definition of fiscal stewardship and oversight, which is what we should be doing. 
Instead, this writer sends the message to grantees that they don't, li- they don't need to live up to the terms of their grant agreements and that no consequences, there, there are no consequences if they fail. I'd like members of Congress to think about the possibilities for other infrastructure investment if we are able to remove this rider. Without this rider, DOT will be able to reallocate $929 million to merit-worthy rail infrastructure, uh, rail projects across the nation. But if the rider stays in, these funds will be locked up and dedicated to a project with a record of repeated failures. And I urge my, the adoption of this ben- amendment, and I yield back. Chairman Price is recognized. Madam Chairman, I rise in opposition to this amendment. At a time when uh, President Trump and Congress are calling for more investment in infrastructure, we shouldn't be terminating projects uh, aimed at improving our national transportation system. Infrastructure programs uh, strengthen our nation. They create jobs. They create opportunities for businesses. During construction, they improve the lives of Americans once completed. And the California high-speed rail project is no different. It exemplifies this. With 2,600 craft laborers, 500 small businesses working on this project. While any project of this scale could be expected to experience the challenges, the fact is that work underway, work is underway. And it's been underway since 2015. Track structures are being completed. Roads are being realigned. Engineering is being finalized. Once completed, it will support California's growing transportation needs and address congestion and increase mobility. Now, the Trump administration has made a decision to single out California and to terminate and de-obligate the fiscal year 2010 grant agreement. Uh, It appears, uh, very strongly appears, that this was grounded in politics, not on any kind of sound management principles. Now, the gentleman's talked about the need for uh, more investment in uh, passenger rail projects. You certainly won't find uh, me disagreeing with that. But diverting this money is not the way to do it. We've provided strong funding for FRA programs. Uh, But FRA has been slow in responding, slow to award these dollars to eligible projects. They're sitting on, uh, they have sat on more than $1.3 billion dollars for the past three fiscal years. Now, so to suggest today that uh, $928 million in de-obligated funding uh, is desperately needed over at FRA for other projects, that's just simply not plausible. It's not accurate. <laughs> FRA's programs are, are under high demand, for sure. But it doesn't seem to be able to manage to award $1.3 billion. So, so how can we expect that they would handle $2.2 billion? Uh, I urge my colleagues to vote against them, this amendment. <clears throat> Mr. Diaz Ballard. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Uh, Chairwoman. I, I strongly support this amendment. Look, the concept of limiting the ability of our agencies to pull back funds from projects that have failed to deliver on their grant agreements. That's what we're dealing with. Failed to deliver on their grant agreements. So again, you know, that's the kind of thing that out there the American people understand. People want investment in infrastructure, but they don't want investment on failed, on issues where they have failed to deliver. And so, again, all this would do is, again, allow, uh, not limit the ability of our agencies to pull back those funds, projects that have failed to deliver on the grant agreement. I think it would also send a very, very dangerous message to other grantees that it doesn't matter if you fail to deliver on your grant agreements because we're never going to take those funds back. I urge a strong vote, uh, yes vote on this amendment. I yield back. Mr. Mr. Aguilar is It's no secret, Madam Chair, that our nation has crumbling infrastructure. And now more than ever, we need to make meaningful reforms to that. We can't play political games or use uh, grant funding as a political chip. And so uh, that's why, uh, that's what this amendment would do. Uh, This funding is already a source of uh, litigation uh, in the state of California. Uh, We cannot establish a precedent where grant funding based on merit and need is stripped away due to partisan whims. Uh, I urge my colleagues to vote against the amendment. Mr. Calvert is recognized. I wasn't going to speak to this, but, uh, you know, this started out, this rail project in California is a rail project from Los Angeles to San Francisco. (laughs) It was going to cost about $20 billion dollars. 
Last estimate is, exceeds $100 billion, and the governor of California rightfully said we're not going to do it. Now it's a project between Merced and Bakersfield, and this money would not even be a drop in the bucket to finish that project. It is absolutely a failed project. It is, it is about as popular in California as the plague. And if anybody thinks that this uh, money, uh, staying in California, is going to finish this project, uh, we got stuff to sell you in California, and it's, not, uh, it's, it's certainly not a rail project. So I would encourage my colleagues, end this thing. Kill it. Please, stop it. Thank you. Miss Lee is recognized. Let me associate myself with uh, the remarks of our chair and just say I've been a longtime supporter of high speed rail and I'm in strong opposition to this amendment, which would remove the language in this bill prohibiting any funds from terminating a grant or agreement for the California High Speed Rail Authority. Now, I know that this ambitious project has encountered challenges, but the people of California support this project because they know high-speed rail will take us into the future. The California high-speed rail project will help modernize our transit system, create jobs, alleviate traffic, and help our environment by reducing transit emissions. Madam Chair, the Trump administration's recent action to pull $1 billion in federal funding for California high-speed rail, it's really a direct assault on the people of California, our green infrastructure, and the thousands of Central Valley workers who are building this project as we speak. This is California's money. It's approved and appropriated by Congress, and we must ensure that this project goes through. California should be allowed to move forward with this project, and so I hope that this committee will stop this amendment and allow, allow us to modernize our transit system. I ask for a no vote on this amendment. If there is no further debate, the member from Idaho is recognized on the amendment for one minute to close. I thank the gentlelady, and if this is California's money, then why didn't the state of California put in their share that they said that they would? They put in about a third of it. The gentleman, I, I have no idea what the politics with the administration are. I've never talked to him about this. I don't know if they support the California High Rail or don't support the high, California High Rail. This is not a political game. This is called oversight, which is what we should be doing. The chairman started his comments on this bill saying, our bill invests in infrastructure. We could invest a billion dollars more in infrastructure if we took this money that's being set, that is just sitting there, locked up, unused, in a failing project that the state of California doesn't even seem to want, according to the governor, and let it go to projects that are worthwhile across the country. If the state of California gets their act together and later on decides that this is something that they want to do, then you can appropriate dollars for it. But why are you keeping a billion dollars locked up that can't be used just sitting there. I don't understand it. I would urge the support of this amendment. The question is on the amendment offered from the member from Idaho. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed say no. 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 In the opinion of the chair, the noes have it, and the amendment is not adopted. A recorded vote has been requested. All those in favor of a recorded vote, raise your hand. A sufficient number being in support, a recorded vote is ordered. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Adderholt. Mr. Adderholt, aye. Mr. Aguilar. Aye. Mr. Aguilar, no. Mr. Amaday. Mr. Bishop. No. Mr. Bishop, no. Mrs. Bustos. No. Mrs. Bustos, no. Mr. Calvert. Aye. Mr. Calvert, aye. Mr. Carter. Aye. Mr. Carter, aye. Mr. Cartwright. No. Mr. Cartwright, no. Mr. Case. No. Mr. Case, no. Ms. Clark. Ms. Clark, no. Mr. Cole. Aye. Mr. Cole, aye. Mr. Chris. No. Mr. Chris, no. Mr. Cuellar. No. Mr. Cuellar, no. Mr. Loro. No. Mr. Loro, no. Mr. Diaz Ballard. Mr. Diaz Ballard, aye. Mr. Fleischman. Aye. Mr. Fleischman, aye. Mr. Fortenberry. Yes. Mr. Fortenberry, aye. Ms. Frankel. Aye. Ms. Frankel, no. Ms. Granger. Aye. Ms. Granger, aye. Mr. Graves. Aye. Mr. Graves, aye. Dr. Harris. Aye. Dr. Harris, aye. Ms. Herrera Butler. Mr. Hurd. Mr. Hurd, aye. Mr. Joyce. Mr. Joyce, aye. Ms. Captor. No. Ms. Captor, no. Mr. Kilmer. Mr. Kilmer, no. Mrs. Kirkpatrick. Mrs. Kirkpatrick, no. Mrs. Lawrence. Mrs. Lawrence. Miss Lee. Miss Lee, no. Mrs. Lowy. No. Mrs. Lowy, no. Miss McCullum. No. Miss McCullum, no. Miss <laughs> Ming. Miss Ming, no. Mr. Molinar. Mr. Molinar, aye. Mr. Newhouse. Mr. Newhouse, aye. Mr. Palazzo. Mr. Palazzo, aye. Miss Pingree. Miss Pingree, no. Mr. Pocan. Mr. Pocan, no. Mr. Price. No. Mr. Price, no. Mr. Quigley. <coughs> 
Mr. Quigley, no. Mrs. Roby. Mrs. Roby, aye. Mr. Rogers. Mr. Rogers, aye. Mr. Robo Allard. Mr. Robo Allard, no. Mr. Ruppersberger. Mr. Ruppersberger, no. Mr. Rutherford. Mr. Rutherford, aye. Mr. Ryan. Mr. Ryan, no. Mr. Serrano. Mr. Serrano, no. Mr. Simpson. Mr. Simpson, aye. Mr. Stewart. Mr. Stewart, aye. Mrs. Torres. Mrs. Torres, no. Mr. Viskowski. Mr. Viskowski, no. Ms. Wasserman Schultz. Ms. Wasserman Schultz, no. Mrs. Watson Coleman. Mrs. Watson Coleman, no. Mr. Womack. Mr. Womack, aye. Does any member wish to record their vote or change their vote? Seeing none, the clerk will tally. On this vote, the ayes are 21, the nays are 29, the amendment is not adopted. Is there any further amendment or discussion? Seeing none, I recognize the gentlewoman from Ohio for a motion, and I ask for your support for this bill. Madam Chairwoman, I move to favorably report the Transportation, Housing, and Urban Development and Related Agencies Appropriations Act 2020 to the House. The question is on the motion. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, no. no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. <laughs> A recorded vote now has been requested. All those in favor of a recorded vote, raise your hand. A sufficient number being in support, a recorded vote is ordered. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Adderholt. No. Mr. Adderholt, no. Mr. Aguilar. Aye. Mr. Aguilar, aye. Mr. Amade. Aye. Mr. Bishop. Aye. Mr. Bishop, aye. Mrs. Bustos. Aye. Mrs. Bustos, aye. Mr. Calvert. Mr. Calvert, no. Mr. Carter. No. Mr. Carter, no. Mr. Cartwright. Aye. Mr. Cartwright, aye. Mr. Case. Aye. Mr. Case, aye. Ms. Clark. Aye. Ms. Clark, aye. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole, no. Mr. Chris. Mr. Chris, aye. Mr. Cuellar. Mr. Cuellar, aye. Mr. Loro. Mr. Loro, aye. Mr. Diaz Ballard. Mr. Diaz Ballard, no. Mr. Fleischman. Mr. Fleischman, no. Mr. Fortenberry. Mr. Fortenberry, no. Ms. Frankel. Ms. Frankel, aye. Ms. Granger. Ms. Granger, no. Mr. Graves. Mr. Graves, no. Dr. Harris. Dr. Harris, no. Mr. Herrera Butler. Mr. Hurd. Mr. Hurd, no. Mr. Joyce. Mr. Joyce. Mr. Joyce, no. Ms. Kaptur. Aye. Ms. Kaptur, aye. Mr. Kilmer. Ms. K Mr. Kilmer, aye. Mrs. Kirkpatrick. Mr. Kirkpatrick, aye. Mrs. Lawrence. Ms. Lee. Ms. Lee, aye. Mrs. Lowy. Aye. Mrs. Lowy, aye. Ms. McCollum. Mrs. McCollum, aye. Ms. Ming. Ms. Ming, aye. Mr. Molinar. Ms. Molinar, no. Mr. Newhouse. Mr. Newhouse, no. Mr. Palazzo. Mr. Palazzo, no. Ms. Pingree. <coughs> Ms. Pingree, aye. Mr. Pocan. Mr. Pocan. Mr. Pocan, aye. Mr. Price. Aye. Mr. Price, aye. Mr. Quigley. <coughs> Mr. Quigley, aye. Mrs. Roby. Aye. Mrs. Roby, no. Mr. Rogers. Mr. Rogers, no. Ms. Robo Allard. Ms. Ro Ms. Robo Allard, aye. Mr. Rupersberger. Mr. Rupersberger, aye. Mr. Rutherford. Mr. Rutherford, no. Mr. Ryan. Mr. Ryan, aye. Mr. Serrano. Mr. Serrano, aye. Mr. Simpson. Mr. Simpson, no. Mr. Stewart. Mr. Stewart, no. Mrs. Torres. Aye. Mrs. Torres, aye. Mr. Viskowski. Aye. Mr. Viskowski, aye. Ms. Wasserman Schultz. Aye. Ms. Wasserman Schultz, aye. Mrs. Watson Coleman. Aye. Mrs. Watson Coleman, aye. Mr. Womack. No. Mr. Womack, no. Does any member wish to record their vote or change their vote? Seeing none, the clerk will tally. <laughs> 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 on
On this vote, the ayes are 29, the noes are 21. The motion is agreed to. Uh, I ask unanimous consent that the staff be permitted to make technical and conforming changes to the bill and report just approved. <coughs> Seeing no objections, so ordered.
Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Before we begin, I'd like to remind my colleagues on both sides of the aisle that we have about an hour and 15 minutes before votes so that we can proceed with thoughtfulness and be expeditious and address the very important issues in this bill. But it's about an hour and 15 minutes before the next vote. So let's proceed. Our third order of business today is consideration of the Agriculture Appropriations Bill for fiscal year 2020. I will now recognize Mr. Bishop to present the bill. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I am pleased to be here today to consider the Agriculture Appropriations Bill, formerly the Agriculture Rural Development Food and Drug Related Agencies uh, Appropriations Bill. I'd like to begin by thanking our ranking member, Mr. Fortenberry. Uh, he is new to our subcommittee, but he served with distinction on the authorizing committee for many years, and he shares my deep passion for our farmers and our rural communities. And it has truly been a pleasure to get to know Mr. Fortenberry better, and I'm proud that we were able to continue the bipartisan spirit that this subcommittee is known for. I'd also like to thank Chairwoman Lowy and Ranking Member Granger, uh, and the other members of the subcommittee, including those we welcome to the subcommittee this year, as well as the full committee. And our associate staffs uh, on the full committee, both minority and majority, uh, who have worked collaboratively uh, to produce what I believe is a very good bill. Lastly, I'd like to thank my personal staff. Now, obviously, we don't agree on all matters, but we share a joint commitment to oversee the spending of the funds in this bill to provide the best possible services to the American people. I'd like to thank my colleagues on the other side of the aisle for their collaboration and for working cooperatively with us. The work of the Agriculture, Rural Development, Food and Drug Administration and Related Agencies Bill touches the lives of every citizen on a daily basis. Many do not recognize the far-reaching jurisdictions and the programs that this subcommittee addresses. A little bit of everything, from food safety to agriculture research to drug approval to rural development to protecting market integrity through the Commodity Futures Trading Commission. This year, the Agriculture Subcommittee received more than 7,200 requests from over 350 members. We worked in a bipartisan manner to include as many requests as possible in our bill. For committee members, we had more than 1,200 requests, and we met 96% of them in whole or in part. The fiscal year 2020 allocation uh, for this bill is $24.3 billion, 4% above the fiscal year 19 enacted level, but more than $5.1 billion above the budget request. Once again, this bill rejects many of the administration's draconian cuts to programs that assist our rural communities and our vulnerable populations. I'd like to take a moment to highlight some key issues. The bill provides nearly $4 billion for rural development programs, including $680 million for broadband programs to continue bridging the digital divide between urban and rural America, and over $38 billion in loans and grants for rural housing, community facilities, and water and wastewater infrastructure. During a time of great uncertainty due to tariffs and natural disasters, this bill provides $1.8 billion for farm programs, including $30 million to assist the implementation of the 2018 Farm Bill. 
It also prohibits the closure of county-level farm service agency offices to ensure that our farmers, our ranchers, and producers receive high-quality customer service. The bill includes $829 million for the Natural Resources Conservation Service to maintain its core conservation mission. There's also $167 million for infrastructure, for watershed and flood prevention, and watershed rehabilitation projects. The bill provides $3.3 billion for agricultural research to ensure that America retains its role as the leader of global agriculture science. It prohibits the use of funds for any relocation costs associated with the Economic Research Service and the National Institute of Food and Agriculture. Our subcommittee's hearing showcased a vast array of informed opinion, including expert witnesses with over 70 years of combined experiences at the two agencies who were all opposed to this proposal. I believe it's a bad proposal that jeopardizes the integrity of science and research at USDA. The bill also rejects the proposed elimination of the Food for Peace and McGovern Dole programs. It provides $1.85 billion for Food for Peace and $235 million for McGovern Dole. These programs send American commodities all over the world to address global hunger and are an essential tool for diplomacy. The bill fully funds the SNAP and the WIC programs to meet expected participation in FY 2020. The bill provides $10 million for school breakfast expansion grants, the first time this program has been funded since 2012. And it funds the summer EBT program at $50 million, which is a $22 million increase. For the Food and Drug Administration, the bill provides $3.26 billion in discretionary funding, which is $185 million above fiscal year 19. Increased funding is dedicated to fighting rare cancers, laying the foundation for more efficient generic drug reviews, improving our response to foodborne illness outbreaks, and the continued implementation of the Food Safety and Modernization Act. The bill funds the Commodity Futures Trading Commission at $315 million, which is a necessary and well overdue increase. Finally, I'm pleased that this bill provides funding for several new programs that were authorized in the 2018 Farm Bill, such as the 1890s Scholarship Program, the Local Agriculture Market Program, Farming Opportunities Training and Outreach Program, and the Competitive Research Equipment Grants Program, to name a few. In closing, this is a good bill, and I ask for your support. And with that, thank you, Madam Chair. It is a pleasure now for me to recognize the subcommittee ranking member, Mr. Fortenberry. <coughs> thank you, Madam Chair, for your recognition. And Madam Chair, if you'll indulge me for a moment, I'd like to divert and reflect openly on something I've been reflecting on privately. Uh, when I was young, my my father died, and my grandfather looked at me one day and he said, Jeffrey, what do you want to do in life? Now, my grandfather had been a county extension agent and had been long associated with a land-grant college. I even remember him telling me a story about how one day he had to pull a horse's hair from its tail in order to have stitching material to sew up a cow that had been severely lacerated. That's the world they lived in. So when he asked me that question, Jeffrey, what do you want to do in life? I said to him proudly, Papa, I want to be a farmer. Well, life didn't exactly take that turn, but I am just frankly amazed. Little could I have imagined that almost 50 years later, here I am as ranking member of the House Agricultural 
Appropriations Subcommittee on Agriculture. I'm proud of that, and I want to thank you all for the investing your confidence in me to help lead this with the good chairman, Mr. Bishop. So I want to thank you, Ms. Lowy, for, again, that confidence and for your leadership, and our ranking member, uh, Ms. Granger, as well, for their leadership on crafting this most important piece of public policy for all America. Chairman Bishop, I want to particularly thank you and commend you for your willingness to work so hard to find a way to get many, many bipartisan issues and member requests into this bill. The committee should know that Chairman Bishop and I had many lengthy and generous discussions as to how to craft this bill. So, Mr. Bishop, again, I'm very grateful for your leadership. The decisions before this subcommittee impact the lives of every American every day, and all of us across the nation are tethered to agriculture in one form or another. And making the decisions on how to allocate $24 billion takes intense commitment. And I believe this bill represents a seriousness of intent. And before I delve into the substantial pluses and a few minuses in the bill, I want to provide some additional context for those of you who may not be familiar with the bigger agricultural picture across America. And where I live in Nebraska, and I think it's safe to say where the chairman lives in Georgia, agriculture is essential to our way of life, to our culture, and who we are as a people. Production agriculture, corn, soybeans, and livestock cover much of our landscape, and it is an important driver of much of America's export prowess. The efficiency, quality, and ingenuity shown by America's farmers provides food security for hundreds of millions of people, both here and abroad. Many of mo those are among the most, are the most vulnerable in the world. It also ensures that Americans enjoy the lowest grocery prices across the world. Agriculture is also more than about bulk production, from the use of advanced robotics to run dairy operations, to enzyme extraction from ethanol production, from the enhancement of critical wetlands, as well as improving crop yields and conservation stewardship practices, our farmers are contributing to human flourishing across our great nation. And many of the technological advancements that we use today have been made possible by the type of investments that are very much a part of this bill. I want to highlight three particular areas. First, the bill's $3.4 billion reflects a commitment to rural development in housing, utilities, and businesses. A particular note is broadband. Chairman Bishop has included report language to encourage the USDA to consider the broader social benefits when the department seeks applications for the $680 million of broadband resources in this bill. It is very important that we measure the impact of broadband out as to how it affects the eco ecosystem of livability. It's not just more wires, but livability from enhanced telehealth, telecommuting, and precision agriculture, as well as other applications to make broadband an effective infrastructure investment in our country. Second, I'm pleased to see an increase of $185 million for the Food and Drug Administration with emphasis on lowering the price of generic drugs. The chairman has also marked investments in food safety by lessening the burden on our state health departments. The states are the ones who apply FDA's high standards for production of foods across the country, and I think that's smart and important. Lastly, when I met the chairman in his office a couple weeks ago, we found common ground, as we often do, on ideas as to how to grow America's agriculture family. This bill includes $5.4 million for the farmer's market and local food promotion program, allowing small, smaller local producers to provide fresh products, gain a source of revenue, connect the urban to the rural, the farmer to the family. <coughs> That's all exciting. In addition to this program, the bill includes investments for tribal demonstration projects, a pilot project for the food distribution program for Indian reservations, and we have a new ag urban agricultural office. It's all about growing the agricultural family. But at its core, this bill is about one thing. It's about food security. Our diverse and plentiful food supply is made possible through hard work, the hard work of our farmers and ranchers, and the public policies that assist them. For those in vulnerable circumstances, the bill provides important funding for all of the USDA nutrition programs 
at levels that ensure that all eligible participants will receive the assistance they need. We also support research and development in agriculture to the tune of $3.3 billion and provide for appropriate oversight of commodity markets in order to provide confidence for business. I can point out many other positive things, but I also must point to several difficulties. First, as our ranking member Granger has consistently mentioned at every appropriation markup, the appropriation bills like a bipartisan bicameral agreement on the budget caps. And lastly, Mr. Chairman, I would, Madam Chair, I would be remiss if I didn't express a deep regret that the bill did not include the previous bipartisan provision that would prevent the human germline gene editing process. This is a prohibition that is accepted by nearly every nation in the world due to the unknown risk. Fortunately, it's my understanding that there may be an agreement on an amendment to restore this important public health policy. In closing, Mr. Chairman, Chairman Bishop, let's keep working together. And I yield back to the chair. Thank you. Thank you. Before I share my remarks, I just want to thank Mr. Fortenberry for sharing with us some of your personal experiences. In fact, as we get to know each other, we all come from different backgrounds. And what makes this committee so important and so special for me is we take those backgrounds, our personal experiences, and bring them to this honored job. So thank you very much. I look forward to continuing to work together, even though we may have some differences of opinion. I would la now like to recognize myself for opening remarks. First of all, I thank Chairman Bishop and Ranking Member Fortenberry for their work on this bill, and I thank the staff for their hard work. We really do appreciate your efforts. The fiscal year 2020 Agriculture Appropriations Bill rejects the President's misguided budget and instead invests in important initiatives for the people. The bill would reduce hunger at home and abroad, support rural development and our farmers, and ensure the FDA is properly funded to meet the growing needs of regulating our food, medicines, and more. Nearly one in five children in America is food insecure. These children are statistically likely to have lower academic achievements. We invest in nutrition and meal programs, not only because it's the right thing to do, but because the success of our economy demands it. If we want to educate our children, have a productive workforce, and continue to lead in the 21st century, <coughs> we must firmly address hunger today. While the president proposed eliminating the summer EBT program, which provides meals for children after the school day and in the summer, this bill would provide a record $50 million for this initiative. The bill would also assist communities working to address food insecurity, improve nutrition, while the president zeroed out WIC Farmers Market Nutrition Programs, the Commodity Supplemental Food Program, and School Kitchen Equipment Grants, this bill would robustly fund these priorities. The bill also rejects the president's effort to eliminate international food aid and instead would provide increases both for McGovern Dole and Food for Peace. For FDA, the bill includes an increase of $185 million. I'm particularly proud that it carries language urging the FDA to expedite pre-market review of e-cigarettes, establish a national track and trace system on tobacco products, and expand the real cost advertising campaign to warn of dangers of nicotine addiction. The bill is also notable for what it does not contain, any political interference on FDA's ability to do its job. I urge support 
And I would now like to recognize Ranking Member Granger for her opening remarks. Thank you, Madam Chair. <laughs> I'd like to congratulate Chairman Bishop for bringing forward the fiscal year 2020 Agricultural Appropriations Bill today. I also want to thank the Ranking Member, Mr. Fortenberry, for his leadership on our committee and on this bill. I appreciate the work both of you have done to find common ground on the vast portfolio of programs funded in this bill that affect Americans across the country. The bill continues to prioritize funding for critical rural infrastructure programs, such as broadband, as well as other important programs that protect the health and safety of our citizens, such as the Food and Drug Administration. The bill prioritizes agricultural research, support for farming practices, and conservation assistance. I also note the support for food aid to the poorest people overseas. This gift from American farmers and producers goes a long way in not only saving lives, but in building goodwill around the world. However, there are several items in the bill that concern me, including the elimination of a provision carried in the bill for the last four years regarding the genetic modification of embryos. It would be irresponsible for us to fund the FDA's review of this it would be irresponsible for us to fund the FDA's review of this very risky research. This bill also includes an increase in more than 4% and above fiscal year, above fiscal year 2019, and in its current form does not reflect a realistic top-line funding level that has bipartisan consensus. I hope the leadership in both chambers will work with the White House to develop a budget framework as soon as possible. We must have a funding agreement that has broad support in order to craft a bill that the president will sign. In closing, I'd like to recognize the members of the subcommittee. I also want to thank my staff, Tom O'Brien, as well as the majority staff for their hard work and long hours. And I thank you, Madam Chair, and yield back. Are there any other members wishing to make general comments about the bill? Ms. Kaptur. Thank you, Madam Chair. Let me begin by thanking uh, Chairman Bishop. Uh, I'm so proud of him and ranking member Fortenberry for your outstanding leadership and efforts to craft such a strong 2020 agriculture appropriations bill, and for both the majority and minority staff whose tireless efforts make <laughs> our work possible. A special thank you to Martha Foley, who has been at the helm uh, since uh, my ranking membership on this subcommittee in, I hate to say it, 2001. I know you'll all remember that. Uh, this um, bill assures food security for our citizenry and supports a wide range of programs for farmers and producers uh, who feed our nation and those beyond our shores. Uh, with population growth and a changing environment, the agriculture needs of this nation continue to stress our current natural systems. To better address these challenges, I'm pleased to see, uh, for example, uh, there is $5 million in funding for the long-awaited Office of Urban Agriculture and Innovation Production, and I thank our ranking member Fortenberry for uh, mentioning that and also uh, Chairman Bishop for being so open to the concept. The office will serve as a driver for growth and development of agricultural technologies to aid in local sustainable food production close to where people live. In addition, the bill increases funding for greenhouse research, and I want to thank uh, Congresswoman Lee so very much for her partnership in this, that will continue uh, will combine the resources of the U.S. Department of Agriculture and the U.S. Department of Energy for development of affordable, deployable, and energy and water efficient technologies to lead our nation into the future of modern, nutrient-rich, local food production, close to where people live. This bill reflects the bipartisan commitment to animal wellness and zo um, zoonotic diseases too. It offers strong support for zoonotic disease research and takes aim at combating foodborne illnesses. The bill directs the FDA to report back on pet food contamination that has already harmed too many of our nation's four-legged family members. Additionally, it includes an extra $2 million for the Center for Veterinary Medicine to amplify research on the purity and safety of ingredients in pet food. This bill reflects generous support for America's most underserved communities and their ability to access basic food necessities. For too long, our country's domestic food programs, SNAP, WIC, and the Commodity Supplemental Food Program have been on the chopping block, but not this year in the House mark. With one in seven Americans facing food insecurity, our nation has to catch up to demand. One program that could help more in addressing this challenge is the Senior Farmers Market Nutrition Program, but that requires additional authorization to meet the need. 
I highlight this as I hope we can work with our authorizers to do this in the near future. This money assists low-income seniors access fresh, nutritious, locally produced fruits and vegetables, herbs and honey. In conclusion, let me thank Chairman Bishop for his leadership in bringing forth a bill that serves the genuine well-being of the American people, our farmers and ranchers, and a commitment to regenerative agriculture. I yield back. Truly, this bill is a backbone of our nation. Ms. McCullum is recognized. to thank the chair and the ranking member for their hard work. And I am very proud and, uh, of this, this bill. It's my first time uh, serving on the Agriculture Subcommittee. And um, gentlemen, I learned a lot. Thank you. They were great hearings. Um, but to, today I'm going to focus on the bill. And this bill is critical, as it's pointed out, to the rural development of our communities. And that's important in Minnesota, too. Um, throughout our state, ensuring that our food uh, is safe, uh, that drugs and cosmetic products uh, protecting the environment from the effects of climate change, preserving natural habitats and fragile ecosystems, they're true in my state and in yours as well. I'm pleased to see that the committee put report language in to increase funding for cosmetic safety oversight. It encourages the FDA to continue working with Congress and stakeholders to modernize a regulatory framework for cosmetics. I think most Americans would be absolutely shocked to learn just how little oversight authority the FDA has on um, the cosmetic industry. And these are our products that we put directly onto our bodies. I was also pleased to see uh, strong funding levels for the food distribution program on Indian reservations. This $3 million uh, for the new program authorized in the Farm Bill allows tribal organizations to enter in self-determination contracts promoting tribal sovereignty and meeting specific tribal and cultural needs. And it will improve the quality of life for our Native brothers and sisters, so I thank you for that. But finally, I want to thank the committee for its work on chronic wasting disease, or CWD. CWD is a highly transmittable de uh, degenerative brain disease. It's similar to mad cow, and currently it f affects such animals as deer, elk, and moose. To date, there is no live test, vaccine treatment, or mandatory eradication uh, program for CWD. The language that was included in this report, as well as the funding and the language in the Interior Bill, reaffirms the federal government's commitment to work with the appropriate state wildlife agencies to help survey, manage, and develop new tools to combat chronic wasting disease. So I look forward to working with the chair and the ranking member and my ranking member, Mr. Joyce, to learn more about what we can do to start uh, um, finding out the cause, the symptom, and the treatment for this disease before it affects even more Americans. Thank you. Mr. Cuellar is recognized for brief remarks because we have an hour before votes on the floor. <laughs> My 10-minute uh, speech. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, uh, Madam Chair, thank you. I, I, I do want to thank, uh, first of all, uh, Chairman Bishop and, and the ranking member, Mr. Fornberry. They do have a plethora of issues that they're addressing, and they've done this in a very, uh, in, in a very gentlemanly way, the way they handle this along with staff. So thank you. Two things real quickly. Uh, cattle fever ticks. I want to say thank you. Um, the, the money that you all added uh, to address the cattle fever ticks, as you know, it's a... It's a, uh, an area that's been guaranteed, that's been growing. Uh, so I do appreciate the, the funding that you all added, including the uh, cost share of construction of livestock fencing also to help guarantee that, uh, quarantine that area. Uh, cattle industry is a $200 billion business in, in, uh, in the U.S., so I want to say thank you. And the other thing that affects uh, also Florida, California, and the state of Texas is the citrus grower uh, support. That is, how do we combat, uh, combat citrus greening disease? As you know, the U.S. industry, uh, citrus industry, has a, uh, more than $11 billion. So the funding that you added for the cattle fever uh, ticks and for the citrus is something that we welcome. So again, to both of you all and to your staff, thank you so much. Ms. Pingree is recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I will be brief. Um, 
But I, too, wanted to concur and, and thank the chair and the ranking member. I'm very proud to be on this committee, and I will dispense with the lengthy story of how my family comes from an agricultural community in Minnesota, but I will tell the chair and ranking member at length at some other moment when we have more time. Um, but uh, so many members have already said great things about this bill, and the chair and ranking member were so articulate in describing how critically important this is. I often think that this is... Um, one of the bills that affects most Americans in ways they know nothing about, and uh, much more important than we give it credit for um, the work that's done at the USDA for rural and urban America. And I just want to bring up a couple of points that I know the committee has been dying to know about that wouldn't have otherwise been included. We heard a little bit about how this supports growing markets for farmers. There's 23 million for the local agriculture market program, 18 million for national organic. Organic agriculture is one of the most fast growing segments of our agricultural system today. $16 million so the USDA can finally implement hemp rules. This is something we've been long waiting for in many states around the country. Uh, we finally are going to re-implement the food lace food loss and waste reduction liaison at the USDA. We waste about 30% of the food in this country, so this is a critically important position to make sure that food ends up where it needs to be and doesn't become an environmental hazard. And there's some other interesting things that will be part of our climate change discussion, which farmers play in a very important role in being allies in the challenges we face around climate change. There's report language to urge the USDA to look at carbon markets for agriculture, which could be a future source of income, supporting the USDA's already existing climate hubs, encouraging the USDA to look at other opportunities to continue to support our farmers. And lastly, um, and importantly, it has language to prevent the USDA from relocating and reorganizing NIFA and ERS. And I won't go into a long description, but the chair has been doing a really great job in making sure this is a cost-effective uh, move, raising important questions around this, and hopefully um, keeping this from happening. So I thank uh, the committee staff and the chair for their very hard work and my colleagues on the subcommittee. Um, I think this is a great piece of work. So thank you, and I yield back. Ms. Roy Bill Allard. Uh, Chairman Bishop and Ranking Member Fortenberry, I commend you on an outstanding agricultural appropriations bill, and I thank you for the many strong nutrition, public health, and animal welfare provi provisions you included in this mark. We all know nutrition plays a critical role in the physical, emotional, and intellectual development of our youth. So I'm very grateful your bill provides strong funding for nutrition programs and child care facilities in the Summer Electronic Benefits Program for school-aged children and for addressing college food insecurity in the report. As co-chair of the Congressional Public Health Caucus, I thank you for including robust funding for vector control to safeguard the public health and for ensuring the capacity and integrity of the FDA Office of Tobacco Control to continue our efforts to reduce youth tobacco exposures. I also appreciate your including language in the report to address the pediatric labeling of over-the-counter fever and pain medications. I also thank, the, uh, thank you for including language that sets new standards for animal welfare by restoring the animal welfare violation records purged by the Trump administration. For the first time, the base bill includes a provision to prohibit horse slaughter and directs FDA to strate strategically reduce non-human primates in its research and retire them to sanctuary. I thank the hardworking subcommittee for their dedication to these programs and for their long hours to produce such an exceptional bill. I urge a yes vote. Ms. Lee is recognized. Our chairman and our ranking member for a very um, important bill to not only rural communities, but to urban communities for our nutrition programs. This is my first year on this subcommittee, and uh, I just want to thank our chairman for the opportunity to work on these very important issues that affect uh, California also. I believe I'm the only member from the state of California on this subcommittee, and so I appreciate the uh, focus on some of our, on our farmers and on uh, the Central Valley and our, our ag community in California. I'm pleased to see a robust funding for the National Organic Program at $18 million, our Specialty Crop Pest Program at $186 million, and $45 million for the Sustainable Agricultural uh, Research and Education Program. 
Collectively, uh, these programs help fund and provide c critical research and education and protect U.S. farmers throughout the nation. Now, last week, I had the privilege to visit uh, Congressman T.J. Cox's district in the Central Valley of California and uh, went to Fresno and uh, his surrounding areas. And I heard of the many challenges and uh, issues faced by our ag sector and our farmers in California. And I just want to say, Mr. Chairman, uh, this bill certainly addresses many, many of the issues that I heard last week. Also, of course, the nutrition increases, the school breakfast expansion grants, the Healthy Food Financing Initiative for a total of $10 million. I'm pleased to see the um, WIC program increased, but also the language, and I want to call this to the committee's attention, on college hunger, which will help ensure that many of our young people in higher education get the nutrition access they need and will ensure that students know they are eligible for SNAP in the first place. Too often, college students who are f food insecure are unaware that they're eligible for SNAP benefits. So this is a major, major deal for our young people, so I want to thank you for that. Also, land-grant colleges allowing the Secretary of Agriculture to waive matching fund requirements for our land-grant colleges. Um, that is so important to uh, California. Our California universities participate in specialty crop research in, uh, initiative programs for citrus and other crops, and so this is an extremely important requirement. Finally, let me just say one of the issues that I have worked on, and, and actually I was on the Ag Committee in my prior life when I was in California legislature, and I focused on trying to really create the nexus between urban and rural communities. And um, actually, as I mentioned last week, brought uh, cows from the Central Valley to Berkeley, California, so our young people could really value and understand the importance of our rural communities and our agricultural sector. So I want to thank the chairman for including language in the bill that directs USDA to continue to prioritize projects that include a component of connecting stakeholders and employers to students, teachers, and schools to facilitate collaboration and communication to ensure that all of our uh, urban and rural students are connected between the connected with urban and rural communities. So I thank you for that language that's in the bill and also the language in terms of the food traceability system, which I heard a lot about last week, the access and data that is critical in tracking foods that are implicated in disease outbreaks. So thank you again, Mr. Chairman. It's, it's a great bill. I want to thank our ranking member and just know that um, there are many of us in, on the West Coast and in California, especially in urban communities, who really uh, understand the importance of, of this bill, bill, and we appreciate your focus and, and assisting us to get our issues in the bill. Thank you again. Ms. Bustos is recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, Chairman Bishop, thank you very much for your hard work on this bill, and also want to thank Ranking Member Fortenberry for, mm -hmm. for your hard work. Uh, I come from a long line of farmers, and I represent a district that is full of growers and producers, and the provisions in this bill affect the region of the country uh, that I serve very heavily. I am pleased with the results and strongly support the great work of the members of this committee and the staff in crafting this bill. I was honored to serve as a conferee on the farm bill negotiations, and I'm pleased that several of my farm bill priorities were funded in this bill. I especially appreciate the inclusion of report language requesting that the Agricultural Research Service fill its vacant staff positions. The reason I am so happy about that is because the Peoria Ag Lab in the congressional district that I serve is the largest federal agricultural research facility in the country and, um, as a side note, helped actually to win World War II. How? By discovering how to produce mass, mass produce penicillin and still today um, is, along with the other federal, federal agricultural research facilities, our leaders, world-class leaders in agricultural research. We need to make sure that we continue to invest in the human capital that drives our agric agricultural research enterprise, and this bill helps to do that. I'm also pleased to see the committee prioritize rural health and rural development that are so vital to communities like the ones that I serve. I fought for a new position of rural health liaison in the Farm Bill, and I'm glad that the committee is prioritizing that position. I also support the increased funding for rural broadband. We live in an information age, and our farmers regularly rely on broadband for precision agriculture that helped them produce the incredible yields that we have seen in the Midwest. 
we need to make sure that rural communities are not left behind and have access to basic 21st century tools. Finally, it's clear that we are facing major infrastructure challenges in rural areas, so I appreciate that the committee increased funding for water and sewer loans that help communities like the ones I serve invest in their critical infrastructure. I strongly support this bill, and I urge my colleagues to do the same. Thank you. With that, I yield back. Mr. Case is recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm happy to support this bill because I agree with the subcommittee chair's statement that this bill fairly represents all of U.S. agriculture. Because just as we, each of us, have different backgrounds, and I have an agricultural background like everybody else, um, so is agriculture different uh, throughout our country. Uh, just as we have uh, the very large crops and very large programs that make up the bulk of our um, assistance um, and policies, so do we have very small crops run by small businesses in small communities that are equally part of U.S. agriculture. Uh, just as we have the four or five mass-produce, mass-consumed crops out there that uh, get all the attention, so do, the, so do we have many, many areas of the country, small specialty crops with niche markets. They don't market to the mass uh, consumer, but to niches. Uh, in Hawaii, for example, macadamia nuts, coffee, tropical flowers and fruits, papaya, and so on. And so, so as most of U.S. agriculture thinks in terms of a seasonal agricultural, agricultural cycle, uh, there are parts of our country like Hawaii where that is not true, where we think about tropical, subtropical agriculture growing all year round in a different crop cycle. Even conservation assistance can be different from a place to place throughout our country, as is rural development. Um, you know, when I was uh, here, here in my prior service, I was honored to serve for four years on the House Agriculture Committee with many of the members here. Uh, and one of the takeaways I had then was that at the time, U.S. farm policy, whether it was overall policy or appropriations, was too heavily slanted towards one side of the U.S. agricultural uh, markets. It didn't uh, adequately account for these uh, smaller crops, uh, smaller specialty areas, tropical agriculture, et cetera. But I think that that has changed. Um, in the last decade plus, I am uh, very happy to say that there's a lot more attention be giving, being given in overall farm policy to the true diversity of uh, U.S. agriculture, and certainly this bill, in its approach uh, to the funding and to the programs that it supports, uh, recognizes that diversity as well. So I thank, I thank the chair and members for doing that. Seeing no other members wishing to make opening remarks, I'd like to recognize Mr. Bishop to offer a manager's amendment. Now, as a reminder, if remarks are not shortened, we will be back after votes. Mr. Bishop, for your eloquent remarks. Madam Chair, I do have an amendment at the desk. It's a manager's amendment. We know. We know. And I'd like to ask that the clerk dispense with the reading. Mr. Bishop, you are recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, before you, and I think it's been passed out as a standard manager's amendment, making non-controversial, technical, and requested changes to the bill and the report. Uh, the amendment has been drafted in consultation and cooperation with Ranking Member Fortenberry, and I urge the adoption of the amendment. And Ranking Member Fortenberry is recognized. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. The Chairman Bishop is correct. I support the amendment and urge its adoption. Are there any other members who wish to be heard on the amendment? Mr. Laura. Mr. Laura. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Madam Chair. I rise in support of the manager's end amendment and would like to thank the chair and the ranking member. The amendment includes record funding uh, at the $90 million authorized level for the WIC Breastfeeding Peer Counselors Program. This is an invaluable service to communities, new mothers. Unfortunately, not every WIC clinic has them. Uh, Connecticut, fewer than half of WIC clinics have a peer counselor. This funding helps to ensure more mothers and children uh, will uh, benefit uh, from the uh, of the, from, from the program. Uh, the amendment also includes language directing USDA to clarify requirements for the product of USA label for meat. Currently, as a loophole in the department's policy means that multinational meat processors can import foreign meat 
and as long as it's been processed in the packing plant in the United States, it can be labeled with product of USA. I believe that's just wrong. American farmers and ranchers do not like it, and from a food safety and labeling standpoint, consumers diverge deserve better. I urge my colleagues to support the amendment. And I recognize Mr. Bishop for one minute to close. I urge the adoption of the management's amendment. The question is on the amendment. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed say no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it and the amendment is adopted. Are there, are there any other further amendments? What purpose does the member from Alabama rise? Madam Chair, I ask for consideration of my amendment, uh, the, number one, and ask that this reading be dispensed with. The clerk will read the amendment. <coughs> Without objection, the reading of the amendment is dispensed with. The member from Alabama is recognized for five minutes on the amendment. Okay, thank you, um, Madam Chair. I, I rise today to offer this amendment. Uh, in the last four years, uh, the bill has carried a prohibition on the editing or modification of heritable, of heritable genes. Uh, a heritable gene, as the name implies, means changing the genes that people pass on to the next generation. And I appreciate uh, my colleagues uh, on the other side, especially uh, Chairwoman Lowy and Chairman Bishop, for agreeing to uh, support this amendment. Uh, to maintain the provision that is uh, in, uh, that has been included in the bill, for, as I say, for the last four years. Back in uh, November of 2018, there was a scientist from China that announced that he had used a gene editing technology called CRISPR to genetically alter the twins, uh, the uh, genes of a twin girls prior to implementation. But uh, the problem is the ethics hadn't caught up with the science, and quite honestly, the science has not even caught up with the science. <laughs> there are just too many unknowns out there. There are too many unintended consequences. The scientists can't even quantify at this point, and uh, we, many of us believe that it's a step too far too soon. The science and the bioethics needed to catch up to prevent the potential disasters is why this uh, amendment is needed. It, it ensures that there is a pause uh, here in the United States until we can catch up, until we can know more about the issue. So, Thank you for your time, and uh, I would ask my colleagues for their support of this amendment. Mr. Bishop. Thank you, Madam Chair. Let me thank the gentleman from Alabama for offering this amendment. Uh, it gives us an opportunity to confront a significant and emerging issue. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a profound moment in the history of mankind. Today, we confront the challenges of many Americans who strongly embrace a faith-based heritage. We also confront a rapid and astounding developments in scientific capacity to advance life-saving research. The fine line uh, that balances our morality and our efforts to improve the quality of human life today and into the future is becoming increasingly blurred. I recognize the controversy surrounding the ethical and moral issues of genetically modifying a human embryo. There is certainly a case to be made for advancing life-saving research. But there's also a case to be made for the possible misuse of this procedure, and a robust discussion is absolutely needed. That is exactly what I was trying to achieve by removing the provision from the subcommittee mark. We have heard reactions both to its inclusion in 2016 and to its removal just two weeks ago on the subcommittee's mark. However, these reactions have all occurred outside uh, our committee del deliberations. I do want to note that I believe that there is a therapy that is prohibited by this language that can possibly address some devastating and fatal diseases of children. It is called mitochondrial replacement therapy. MRT should not be thought of as a genetic enhancement because it's not. It's a repair. The National Academy of Sciences looked at this at the request of FDA and concluded that, and I quote, 
quote, it is ethically permissible to conduct clinical investigations of MRT subject to certain conditions and principles laid out in their report. I believe that we need to have a discussion about mitochondrial replacement therapy at some point. But today is not that time. And this Appropriations Committee markup is not the place. It needs very close authorizing scrutiny and input. We agree to accept the amendment, but I look forward to our continuing to study uh, this issue so that we can really reach a real moral as well as scientific uh, analysis of where we must go as humankind as we develop and we look at to the scientific advances uh, in this age. With that, I yield back uh, the balance of my time. Mr. Fortenberry. Thank you, Madam Chair, for recognizing me. Chairman Bishop is exactly right. This is a transcendent issue. Uh, let me start by another personal story, if I could, please. On September 1st of the year 2000, I received a very hard phone call. The day before, my wife Celeste and I had welcomed our third baby daughter into the world. And I, they were resting comfortably at the hospital, and so the next day I went back to work. Then I received a phone call. She said, come back, please, hurry. I said, what's the matter? I don't know, just come back, hurry. You can imagine how anxious that car ride was for me. And when I got there, a routine check of the baby had discovered that she had multiple congenital heart defects. She had what's called complete atrial ventricular septal defects. So you can imagine again how my wife and I were confused by the barrage of medical information being thrown at us and bewildered as to what the next steps ought to be. My own personal research led me to read, even read the literature coming out of Switzerland that was looking at how adult stem cells could potentially grow uh, a new aorta order for her because that's primarily what was wrong, that was missing. And what parent wouldn't search the world over for a cure for their child? For us, that particular innovation was premature, and Catherine, since, has had 12 surgeries. She has multiple mechanical devices, but you know what? It's working. She has the possibility now of living a normal life. If she had been born 20 years earlier, she probably would have died by the year of 30, being 30 years old. And it was through the, this innovation and advancement in science that made that life extension possible for her. So when we search passionately for answers and align them with effective science, reason, and ethics, we have a holistic approach to compassionate care. And there's an example before us already. This very committee, over the last 10 years, has poured billions of dollars into new and appropriate funding into the National Institutes of Health for one reason, to search for cures and effective treatment for people who are suffering. But herein lies the problem. If we cede that type of framework of science and ethics to maverick bioengineers who are detached from larger societal considerations, the risks of harm are real, and we will divert our resources away from real, viable alternatives, potentially. In the case of the doctor who skirted U.S. law to engage in mitochondrial transfer, his own findings are showing that the disease is still present in that child. The child is also supposed to be tracked for their entire life, and the risk of the child may not be known to the child, may not be known for decades. As Congressman Adderholt mentioned in a related manner, a rogue Chinese scientist who manipulated the DNA of twin girls created a firestorm across the international bioscientific community. And just this week, a study from the University of California at Berkeley found that these twin babies are now likely to die 20% younger than they should and are more susceptible to other diseases. 
What's less known are the risks that they will pass on to their own children. Just in March, Dr. Francis Collins, who was appointed by President Obama to head the National Institute of Health, had this to say. Given the lack of compelling medical need, the safety concerns, and the profound societal and philosophical issues, NIH strongly agrees that an international moratorium on reproductive uses of human germ line gene editing should be put into effect. If we can pause, and if we can align science and reason and ethics and other safeguards, we can innovate in order to authentically alleviate human suffering. Thank you, Madam Chair. Four years ago, without any debate, this rider was inserted into an appropriations bill. I believed then, as I believe now, that the authorizing committees of jurisdiction, with the guidance of the scientific community and full transparency, should debate the merits of this research. This rider amounted to a blanket denial for the FDA to review applications related to the modifications of an embryo without the merits of the individual case. I understand concerns that gene editing can allow for unsettling genetic enhancements which may be against our values. But it is also true that medical research, including in mitochondrial replacement therapy, could reduce suffering and save lives. While some may feel a moral obligation to oppose this research, others of us feel that we have a moral obligation to allow advances in science so fewer parents will have to watch a child die of a heritable disorder and to help eradicate terrible, deadly diseases that can be passed down from generation to generation. Other nations have standards for this type of research to take place. For instance, in the United Kingdom, <clears throat> mitochondrial replacement therapy is permitted under strict guidelines, including a license requirement and a finding that an individual with a mitochondrial abnormality poses a significant risk to pass on a serious mitochondrial disease to their child. It is my hope that the authorizing committees take note of this debate and do their oversight <laughs> work on this matter and allow the appropriators to do what we do best, fund the important work of this nation. And with that, I reluctantly support inclusion of the gentleman's amendment. I yield back. Ms. Wasserman-Schultz. Thank you. Um, I, I wasn't, I wasn't going to say anything, but the, uh, the chairwoman's remarks really made me think a little bit more carefully about this. And um, probably a lot of you know that I carry a genetic mutation, the BRCA2 genetic mutation. When I was diagnosed with breast cancer 11 years ago, I uh, had no idea that I was a carrier of that genetic mutation, nor did I know that Ashkenazi Jews, Jewish people of Euro Eastern European descent, are five times more likely to carry that mutation, making it astronomically more likely that I would get breast cancer, likely at a young age, ovarian cancer, before I was 50, at which thankfully I did not have because I found out early enough and, uh, and other kinds of cancer that I would be at risk for for the rest of my life. This is a mutation that is passed on, not needing to be born by both parents. So my three children, including my son, all have to be tested at a certain point, probably in their mid-20s, in order to determine whether or not they have to take precautions in order to deal with the possibility of getting breast cancer themselves. Now, obviously, it is too late for them, but now, if we ever have an opportunity when they have children or when they decide to have a family, 
to have research advanced to a point where you could have their genetic material, when combined with their partner, altered so that that mutation could be cut off in our family tree, and that risk of, of death and massive health care implications could be eliminated, that's incredibly important. I, I won't go into more detail, but I have a staff person, a former staffer, who also has experienced similar family lineage through genetic mutations that affected a parent that because she is a carrier of, a, of, this, of this mutation will affect her, and she is concerned about when she and her husband decide to have children, you know, how they can avoid that. So it is not as simple as saying, this, this is not, you know, 2001 Space Odyssey or 1984 or, you know, a mad scientist playing games with genetic material. There are real opportunities, as the ranking member said, to try to cut off the passing on of genetic mutations that, that can have dramatic life-altering implications. And so I would urge <laughs> caution as well. Um, I'm not in favor of this amendment. Um, I was reluctant. I'm beyond reluctance. I, I understand that we will carry this language, but this is something that absolutely has to be dealt with and reviewed by the authorizers sooner rather than later. Thank you. I yield back. If there is no... If there's you know, the, the subcommittee chairman, Mr. Bishop, uh, is right. You know, the, the language is relatively broad. At the time it was first proposed, the only thing that were involved were, of course, the three parent, quote, three parent embryos, which have to do with, the, <clears throat> with those rare genetic diseases that October in the journal Nature. The, there, there's the report of what's called programmable gene editing, which actually goes and reverses the mutation in your own genetics, single base pair mutations account for the vast majority of these diseases, which I think will remove all the ethical questions. So you're right. We, d we do need this looked at because these, the technology is way ahead of what, we're, what, what our languages are in these bills. It does need the authorizing committees, and there is a light at the end of the tunnel that I think removes a lot of the ethical questions, and that's the good news. So I rise in support of the amendment as it is now, but with the caveat that this is going to need to be looked at because the technology is way advancing, way more rapidly than what this amendment suggests. I yield back. If there is no further debate, the member from Alabama <coughs> is recognized on the amendment for one minute to close. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. And, and let me just say, I think the comments <coughs> were made or were, uh, have been uh, very appropriate, but the bottom line is the science and the bioethics need to catch up with potential disasters that could occur. Uh, you may, they may be <coughs> thinking they will, something can be alleviate, alleviated or fixed, but potentially what is passed on to the next generation could be far worse. And therefore, we just need to find out more before we move forward with this. And that's what this amendment does. And uh, therefore, I yield back and ask for passage of the amendment. The question is on the amendment offered by the member from Alabama. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed say no. no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it, and the amendment is adopted. <coughs> For what purpose does the member from Connecticut rise? I have an amendment at the desk and ask for unanimous consent that the reading be dispensed with. Without objection, the reading of the amendment is dispensed with. The member from Connecticut is recognized for five minutes on the amendment. Uh, I offer this amendment with my colleague from North Carolina, Mr. Price, and our amendment would require that the Inspector General <coughs> to submit its findings on the underlying data the Department of Agriculture used to develop and design its proposed rule to, quote, modernize swine slaughter inspection. The amendment 
would then require the USDA to address and resolve any issues identified by the IG prior to implementing the proposed rule. The proposed rule is an attempt to give multinational meat processors more authority and control over the health and safety conditions in their own plants. And it transfers vital inspection duties currently performed by USDA inspectors to company employees. That would be company-based inspection. If this rule is finalized, I believe it would endanger food safety inspections, workers, consumers, and animal welfare. The proposed rule removes all limitations on line speeds in hog slaughter plants, which will endanger the health and safety of tens of thousands of workers in meatpacking plants. Unlimited line speeds also negatively impact humane animal handling and the ability to maintain food safety safeguards. Additionally, USDA has refused to develop standards to test for salmonella and other harmful pathogens in pork, which were in place when a similar rule was issued for poultry during the Obama administration. Without these standards in place, we have no assurances that the department will be able to tell if the new inspection system is making our food more or less safe. Moreover, according to the National Employment Law Project, FSIS failed to seek peer review from its risk assessment on the role in violation of rulemaking requirements set by OMB. The agency also hid from the public the worker safety analysis that relied on um, uh, in, the, in the rulemaking, refusing to make it available to the public during the rules comment period. And when the data was made available, independent expert researchers who analyzed it determined that USDA used flawed analysis and that it based its findings on erroneous assumption. This is why I believe that we need to have the Inspector General take a serious look at the underlying data that USDA used in crafting this rule. And I ask my colleagues to support this amendment to ensure that this occurs before USDA implements these changes. Mr. Price is recognized as a co-sponsor of the amendment. Thank you, Madam Chair. I uh, rise in support of uh, my colleague, Mr. Laurel's amendment as a representative of the state that is uh, the second largest uh, producer of pork and pork products in, uh, in this country. I am convinced that the Trump administration's proposed um, swine inspection system poses uh, multiple dangers. It would spread trained inspectors even more thinly than they're spread now, and it would turn, in many instances, the job of identifying and removing diseased animals over to untrained uh, plant workers. It would endanger workers in, uh, in, in uh, meatpacking plants, greatly speeding up the uh, production line. It would compromise uh, humane slaughter of the animals. And it would endanger, as a result of all of this, it would endanger uh, food safety and public health. Now, the idea of speeding up these lines uh, may be a matter of uh, corporate profit, but uh, it would be corporate profit that comes at a frightful expense, at the expense of worker safety and public safety and animal welfare. So the rule's deeply flawed. And the USDA has followed a flawed process in issuing it. So until the Food Safety and Inspection Service has addressed and resolved issues identified by the Office of Inspector General, this rule should not be implemented. So I strongly urge colleagues to vote yes on this amendment, prevent the implementation of this hazardous rule. Mr. Bishop. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chairman. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chairman. I rise in support of the amendment. The proposed swine slaughter rule removes limitations on land speeds and hog slaughter plants, which may endanger the health and safety of tens of thousands of workers in meatpacking plants. 
any increase in line speed may increase risk of injury. It's my understanding, however, that the Inspector General is looking into worker safety data that's used in the development of this rule. I believe at a minimum, it would be prudent to hold off implementing this rule, not necessarily permanently, but at least until the Inspector General has had the opportunity to review the worker safety data upon which the rule is based. With that, I urge a yes vote, and I support uh, the amendment. Mr. Fortenberry is recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair. I rise in opposition to the amendment that would prohibit USDA from moving forward with the implementation of the swine slaughter modern, modernization final rule. There is much information and, and accusations uh, that have entered this debate surrounding the voluntary opt-in inspection system for market hog establishments. It's a voluntary system, so each plant will decide which system is best based upon a variety of factors. And for over 20 years, the Food and Safety, Safety and Inspection Service has been operating a pilot program to modernize the outdated swine slaughter process. The work to modernize inspection spans the last four presidential administrations, Democrats and Republicans. Certain uh, critics of the plan have made claims about the transfer of power or authority to industry or plant owners, but by law, only federal inspectors do meet inspections. Also, there are claims that these plants have higher injury rates. The Food Safety and, Inspe Food Safety and Inspection Service compared establishment injury rates between the piloted program and traditional establishments from 2002 to 2010. The preliminary analysis shows that the pilot program establishments had lower injury rates. The proposed rule also would require a plant that voluntary opts for this new system to provide safety attestations annually. At any time, FSIS inspectors would have the authority to reduce speeds if they believe the line speed imposes a safety risk on workers. USDA inspectors will remain in the plant on duty, focusing their efforts on microbiological safety, which is most important for reducing foodborne illnesses. The pilot has demonstrated positive food safety results for the establishments in the 20 years, across the 20 years, and that is what we all want to see reductions in foodborne illnesses. And just like a similar program po proposed under the Obama administration for poultry and allowed to move forward without interference from Congress, this rule should move forward as well. And I ask my colleagues to oppose the amendment. If there is no further debate, oh, Ms. Dr. Harris. Thank, thank you very much. I'll be brief. Uh, this applies, obviously, to, the, to, to, to swine. But in my district, you know, poultry is an important industry, and there have been measures uh, to look at line speed in the poultry plants. I do believe you can walk and chew gum at the same time. I think that uh, it is possible to make our American processing of livestock more efficient and more safe. And there are elements of the, of the proposed rule that do this by freeing up these inspectors to do things, as the ranking member suggests, looking at microbiological contamination, for instance. So I think that, you know, we're in a global competition. We do things very, very well in this country, but make no mistake, there are other countries that would love to take our pork-producing industry, our poultry-producing industry, decimate it, and become the suppliers to the world. We do things the best. I think these rule, this rule is carefully thought out. I think it does, ma does make us more effective and efficient with regard to international trade and our ability to supply food to other nations as well as keep our workers and our population safe. So I would oppose this amendment. This, this will keep our regulatory burden relatively high. And in this day and age, this is not, this is not what our goal should be. I yield back. If there is no further debate, the member from Connecticut is recognized on the amendment for one minute to close. couple of points. USDA has not developed standards to test for salmonella <clears throat> and other harmful pathogens, which were in place when a similar rule was issued for poultry during the Obama administration. FSIS failed to seek peer review from its risk assessment <laughs> on the rule in violation of rulemaking requirements set by OMB. Uh, I also might add, 
we are looking at a process in which we are 1,100 uh, hogs per hour go through the um, uh, line, uh, making it, uh, and this would make it unlimited line speeds uh, to move forward on. The amendment is supported by a broad coalition of labor, worker safety, food safety, animal welfare organizations. Rule faces steep public opposition. Over 80,000 comments were filed on the proposed rule with an overwhelming amount submitted in opposition. At the very, very least, we should know whether or not the US re USDA relied on flawed data and an analysis when creating what is a radical new system that transfers inspection responsibilities from the USDA inspectors who are highly trained to company employees who are not highly trained. This is exactly what my amendment does. I urge my colleagues to support it. Thank you. The question is on the amendment offered by the member from Connecticut. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Uh, those opposed say no. No. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it, and the amendment is adopted. For what purpose does the member from Washington rise? Madam Chair, I've got an amendment at the desk, and I'd like to ask it considered read. Without objection, the reading of the amendment is dispensed with. The member from Washington is recognized for five minutes on the amendment. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My, amem my amendment is a simple no-funds provision to prevent the closure or the alteration of Forest Service Jobs Corps Civilian Conservation Centers, or CCCs. The, the administration just recently announced a major disruption of these centers, in, including closing nine out of the 25 facilities around the country and transferring operations for the others from the U U.S. Forest Service into the Department of Labor. Now, these 25 centers provide critical support to rural communities in maintaining public lands, actively managing our, our nation's forests, and helping restore communities harmed by catastrophic wildfires. The Forest Service is uniquely qualified to teach conservation tools and the specialized skills required to prevent and mitigate the risk of catastrophic wildfires that we face each year all while providing job training and skills development to young people and students in these Job Corps programs. These students provided public service, one which would be far more expensive to replace than the way we currently offer under the program. As these students perform this public service, they gain valuable skills that shape the rest of their lives. I have met many of these students and their families, and I can tell you that these centers provide both an investment for the conservation of our public lands, but more importantly, a human investment in our communities. Three of these facilities are in central and eastern Washington. Two of them are in my district. The Fort Simcoe facility is located on the Yakima Indian Na Nation Reservation in White Swan, which is slated to be terminated under the administration's proposal and the Columbia Basin facility in Moses Lake, which is to be consolidated. <coughs> Both of these facilities rank in the 90th percentile. If we, if we close these facilities or move the others under the operation of DOL, we will lose the Forest Service expertise and the wildfire suppression-based mission so vitally important to rural communities in my district and those around the country, many of which are surrounded with vast national forests and have been inundated by large catastrophic wildfires in recent years. Madam Chair, I have to say, it appears the administration's rollout of this proposal was done carelessly and without the data or the statistics to point to any rhyme or reason as to how the decisions were made. In fact, many of the facilities slated to be closed, like the Fort Simcoe facility in my district, are some of the highest performing centers in the country. Just this morning, it was reported that President Trump overruled his own administration's proposal to close a high-performing facility in the state of Montana because 
the junior senator from Montana, called the president to protest its closure. Well, Madam Chair, I can tell you I am working with more than 50 members of Congress on both sides of the aisle, on both sides of the rotunda, to send a letter to the administration opposing the closure of, or transfer of facilities in our own districts. I would hope that the administration hears loud and clear, but in the meantime, I respectfully ask for my colleagues' support on this amendment, and I yield back the balance of my time. And I'm delighted to give the microphone to our distinguished chair, Mr. Bishop. I thank the general lady for recognizing me. Uh, let me just say I rise in strong support of this amendment. As the co-chair of the Congressional Job Corps Caucus, uh, I feel very, very uh, offended that the administration would take this move. The program has a track record of success, uh, including more than 300 students that were sent to wildfire assignments in 2017 that provided over 200,000 hours of support in fighting the wildfires. Just yesterday in the House, we passed a $19.1 billion disaster bill for multiple natural disasters, including wildfires, uh, that pro provides relief once the president signs it for many, many communities that were impacted. Wildfires are a tremendous threat uh, to our nation, particularly in the western part of our nation. We need all of the apprentices that can be trained by the Job Corps uh, to assist the Forest Service in fighting and preventing uh, these wildfires. I think it's a bad move, and had this amendment not been introduced by Mr. Newhouse, I would have introduced it myself. So I urge a yes vote on this amendment. Uh, Ms. McCollum, and then I want to remind my colleagues, the vote is coming shortly. <laughs> Ms. McCollum. Th thank you, Madam Chair. I strongly support uh, continuing to operate the Civilian Conservation Corps. Just less than a month ago, this committee passed the Labor uh, Health and Human Services Bill, and I thank uh, uh, Chair Delora for that. Um, and we rejected the president's budget proposal to cut funding to Job Corps and close these centers. So we've taken a position that we support these centers. And I'm going to give you some national statistics. I don't have one of these centers in, in my congressional district, but this is important to the work that Ranking Member uh, Joyce and I and the rest of us on the Interior uh, Subcommittee do. Um, should these uh, centers be closed? The loss of 1,300 full-time and temporary jobs in the U.S. Forest Service. 3,000 students at risk of losing the opportunity to develop the necessary skills. And then students at these centers, they support the Forest Service in conservation, forest restoration, which is important to drinking water and wild land firing. Uh, we're entering another season, as, as the chair pointed out. This administration by, uh, would propose to cut these four service centers, which provide 370,000 hours of student work in wildfire prevention and suppression. So I, I, that's all I wanted to add. This will add to our budget in, in having to recover and do more disaster relief if we don't adopt this amendment. I yield back. Ms. DeLaura. Thank you, Madam Chair. I rise in support of the amendment. For more than 50 years, the Job Corps program has offered economic and academic enrichment for disconnected youth. According to data from the Department of Labor, in the first half of program year 2018, more than half of Job Corps enrollees were high school dropouts. Nearly a quarter were from families receiving public assistance, and almost a third have a self-reported disability. Clearly, there is a need to invest in this program. Instead, the President's budget request proposes to cut $703 million, a reduction of 41 percent from the Job Corps program uh, overall. As my colleague from Minnesota pointed out, we rejected that proposal in the Labor H bill and instead invested an additional $150 million. The administration claims civilian conservation centers are overrepresented among low-performing centers. That is not the case. In fact, 
Those, these centers are overrepresented in the ranks of the highest performing job core centers. Program year 2017, six of the top 15 job core centers were civilian conservation centers, including the highest performing center in the country. I am glad to support this amendment that rejects the administration's plan to terminate the joint partnership between the USDA and the Department of Labor that governs the operation of Job Corps Civilian Conservation Centers. The Trump administration would turn its back on disconnected and vulnerable youth, especially those that depend on the Job Corps program in rural communities. But I am confident that Congress will take the necessary steps to make sure that this does not happen. These centers give disadvantaged young people valuable on-the-job experience and training, putting them on a path to a good job while learning how to conserve and how to protect our natural resources. I urge my colleagues to vote in favor of this amendment. Mr. Pocan. Thank you, Madam Chair. I also rise to support uh, Mr. Newhouse's amendment. Um, when we finished a very strong bill in committee, and I want to con congratulate our subcommittee chair and ranking member and the staff uh, for the strong bill. Uh, after that, the administration made this decision on a Friday before we left to go home last week, and I went to a meeting that Wednesday, and it kept coming up from uh, contractors and from labor, uh, not just the great work that happens around uh, working on forest fires and other issues, but how it helps to connect people to trades to get good pay paying family supporting jobs. I have a, a center in my state about as far away from my district as you could possibly be, and yet the impact from my district, this came up over and over that day, just showed how important it was. So I just wanted to rise and uh, support this bipartisan effort on behalf of Mr. Newhouse, and I support the amendment. If there is no further debate, the member from Washington is recognized on the amendment for one minute to close. Madam Chair, and I appreciate all the positive comments around this issue. You know, I'm a strong supporter of the administration's commitment to bringing uh, prosperity to rural America. Their, their focus on promoting policies to protect rural communities uh, is critical, truly is critical to uh, America's national security, our stability, and the prosperity to uh, rural areas around the country. But, but unfortunately, this recent proposal by the Forest Service to close these Job Corps facilities and remove the forest-based mission uh, from the remaining centers will hurt rural America. And that's, that's a simple enough statement. <laughs> that is what this will do. And therefore, I humbly ask you to support this amendment to prevent this misguided proposal from moving forward. And thank you, and we would be reserve the balance of my time. The question is on the amendment offered by the member from Washington. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed say no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. The amendment is adopted. Uh, for what purpose does the member from Alabama rise? Yes, Madam Chair, I ask for consideration of my amendment at Holt 2 and ask for dispensing of the reading. The member from Alabama is recognized for five minutes on the amendment. Uh, Madam Chair, I uh, rise today so, to um, uh, support what I believe is a very common sense um, Democrat Republican amendment. Uh, that uh, according to the FDA, e-cigarette use among teenagers have reached an epidemic uh, proportions. The FDA's 2018 National Youth Tobacco Survey found that there was a 78% increase in e-cigarette use among high school students and an alarming 48% increase among middle school students last year. Uh, and the 2019 survey is probably going to show even more. Roughly 90% of adult smokers begin smoking before they're 18, and studies have shown that if young people don't, do, do not start using tobacco products by their mid-20s, they're really less likely to do so in the future. Uh, there's a very important aspect about this amendment, raising the age to 21. The uh, former FDA commissioner, uh, Scott Gottlieb, he stated that much of the youth access isn't just 14 and 15 year old buying illegally in convenience stores, it's enterprising 18 year olds that are selling to minors. And bear in mind that 
most students, most seniors, have already turned 18 when they graduate from high school. To address this problem head on, this amendment would simply raise the federal minimum age for tobacco use to 21, thereby limiting youth access to the tobacco products, including e-cigarettes. It should be noted that when, ra when you raise the minimum tobacco age to 21, it's likely to drive minors to purchase e-cigarettes online. This amendment also includes legislation that requires online sellers of vape products to verify a customer's identity through a third-party database before they can continue to purchase, and also it requires a person 21 years of age or older to sign for the product to be delivered. Earlier this year, I introduced the Scott Act with a bipartisan bill with my colleague Juan Vargas from California uh, that will provide a solution for youth nicotine addiction epidemic. Since then, I've worked with a lot of outside groups, including the Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids, the American Heart Association. I've listened to their concerns. Therefore, in this amendment, we have changed the definition of vapor products that they found somewhat troubling. And in this amendment, we've inserted definition says electronic nicotine delivery systems that is found in a bill that has already been endorsed by Safe Kids and also by Representative DeGette and also uh, Senator Durbin on the Senate side. Again, this amendment is bipartisan. It's a common <laughs> sense solution to a problem that must be addressed. And I would yes ask a yes and I yield back. For what purpose does the member from Maryland rise? Uh, Madam Chair, I have a secondary amendment at the desk, and I ask unanimous consent to consider being read. Without objection. Uh, you know, I, I would agree that the gentleman, uh, with the gentleman, and I think we're all disappointed that, that we see young teenagers uh, using these vape products. They shouldn't be using them. They're getting them from 18-year-olds and 19-year-olds. They're in their high school. They buy them. They sell, turn around and sell. But there, is, there are a group of 18 to 21-year-olds who are not going to engage in this activity. And that's what my amendment does. It says, you know what, we're going to exclude people in the military. Because I guarantee you someone in the military is not going to high school during the day. They're usually removed from their neighborhoods. Uh, when Maryland passed, we just, uh, our legislature just passed a similar rule, increasing the age to 21, we excluded the military. I think we ought to. Because they don't, they're not part of this problem. And, you know, if we're going to ask someone to go and defend our country, carry a gun, carry a rifle, put in their lives on stake, they should be old enough to make this decision on their own without endangering others. I yield back. Before I turn to Chair Bishop, I want to remind members that we are now considering the Harris Amendment to the Adderholt Amendment. And after we dispense with the Harris Amendment, we still have to vote on the Adderholt Amendment, either as amended, amended by Dr. Harris or as it was originally introduced. Mr. Bishop. Shoot. I thank the gentlelady for recognizing me. Um, as most of you know, I represent uh, several military installations. There are a number of young people in the age group between 18 and 21 uh, who are members of our military and who uh, sacrifice day and night uh, in defense of our country. Uh, and I certainly uh, believe that they should not be, uh, once they have uh, enlisted in the military and put themselves on it, we should not limit their access to uh, tobacco products. Uh, I think that they are well aware and they are certainly mature enough uh, to make their own decision. And with that, uh, I will uh, personally uh, support the gentleman's secondary amendment. And I rise in opposition to Mr. Harris's second degree as well as Mr. Adderholt's underlying amendment. The gentleman comes before us with an amendment that would substantially change the law, but we received this amendment well after today's committee activities began. We've had no time to consult with the authorizers or receive technical assistance from FDA. I hate to sound like a broken record, but for many years now, I've opposed efforts in this committee to alter FDA's role in regulating e-cigarettes and other tobacco products. And while I strongly support raising the smoking age to 21 nationally, 
There are multiple authorizing bills pending before Energy and Commerce that would do exactly that. Our own committee member, Mr. Stewart, has a strong bill with Rep. DeGette. We want that bill to go through regular order. On substance, Mr. Adderholt's amendment would also take too long to fully implement by requiring FDA to issue a regulation on raising the tobacco purchase aid within two years of an enactment, whereas the DeGette Stewart bill would take effect in January of 2020. I appreciate Mr. Adderholt's desire to address youth nicotine addiction, but this amendment in this venue is not the proper way to proceed, and I urge opposition. If there is no further debate, the member Madam from DeLauro. Oh, Mr. Laura. I, I, I just thought it just was brought to my attention because the issue of the military has been raised here. Uh, uh, after Hawaii raised its tobacco sale age to 21, effective January 1st, 2016, Hawaii's military bases opted to comply with a higher age in recognition of its benefits to readiness, health, and finances. Bill Doty, spokesman for the Navy Region Hawaii, stated, and I quote, we see it as a fitness and readiness issue. When we can prevent sailors from smoking or using tobacco, if we can get them to quit, then that improves their fitness and readiness, and it saves them a ton of money as well. Rear Admiral John Fuller, Navy Region Hawaii Naval Service Group, Mid Middle Pacific, stated, I've heard this argument by some shipmates against cracking down on tobacco. If someone is young enough to die for their country, they should should be free to be allowed to smoke. But turning that argument on its head, if someone is young enough to fight for their country, they should be free from addiction to a deadly drug. Tobacco harms people's physical well-being, leads to illness, and costs them money. Let's listen to the military and not just be anecdotal about what we say here. Thank you. If there is no further debate, the member from Maryland is recognizing the amendment for one quick minute to close. Uh, thank you very much. Look, I, I, I thank the chairman of the uh, subcommittee for supporting the amendment. This is very simple. You know, we ask our young men and women in uniform to put their lives on the line. We trust their decision to have entered the military. We should trust their decision to what to do with their life with a legal product after they're in the military. I yield back. The, qu the question is on the amendment offered by the member from Maryland. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed say no. No. In the opinion of chair, the noes have it. The amendment is not adopted. If there's no further debate, the member from Alabama is recognized on the amendment for one minute to close. A particular issue. It uh, makes it harder for the actual pur purchase of tobacco products by requiring a third-party database to verify the customer's identity and age, and it requires a signature on delivery uh, for someone 21 years of age uh, or older. So again, uh, I believe this is a common sense language. This is something we all feel very strongly about. This is something we can move forward with uh, and instead of waiting on the authorization bill. And uh, I, this is, to me, is something that uh, is common sense language that Republicans and Democrats, as well as mothers and fathers, uh, could support. And I urge a yes. The question is on the amendment offered by the member from Alabama. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed say no. 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 In the opinion of the chair, the noes have it. The amendment is not adopted. A recorded vote has been requested. All those in favor of a recorded vote, raise your hand. A sufficient number being in support, a recorded vote is ordered. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Adderholt. Aye. Mr. Adderholt, aye. Mr. Aguilar. Aye. Mr. Aguilar, no. Mr. Amade. Aye. Mr. Bishop. Aye. Mr. Bishop, aye. Mrs. Bustos. Aye. Mrs. Bustos, no. Mr. Calvert. Aye. Mr. Calvert, aye. Mr. Carter. Aye. Mr. Carter, aye. Mr. Cartwright. No. Mr. Cartwright, no. Mr. Case. No. Mr. Case, no. Ms. Clark. Ms. Clark, no. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole, aye. Mr. Christ. Mr. Christ, no. Mr. Cuellar. Mr. Cuellar, aye. Mr. Loro. Mr. Loro, no. Mr. Diaz-Balart. 
Mr. Diaz Villard, aye. Mr. Fleischman, Mr. Fleischman, aye. Mr. Fortenberry, Mr. Fortenberry, aye. Ms. Frankel, Ms. Frankel, Ms. Frankel, Ms. Granger, aye. Ms. Granger, aye. Mr. Graves, Mr. Graves, aye. Dr. Harris, Dr. Harris, aye. Mr. Rare Butler, Mr. Hurt, Mr. Hurt, aye. Mr. Joyce, Mr. Joyce, aye. Ms. Captor. Ms. Captor, no. Mr. Kilmer, Mr. Kilmer, no. Mrs. Kirkpatrick, Mrs. Kirkpatrick, no. Mrs. Lawrence, Mrs. Lawrence, no. Ms. Lee. Ms. Lee, no. Mrs. Lowy. No. Mrs. Lowy, no. Ms. McCollum. No. Ms. McCollum, no. Ms. Ming. No. Ms. Ming, no. Mr. Molinar. Mr. Molinar, aye. Mr. Newhouse. Mr. Newhouse, aye. Mr. Palazzo. Mr. Palazzo, aye. Ms. Pingree. No. Ms. Pingree, no. Mr. Pocan. No. Mr. Pocan, no. Mr. Price. No. Mr. Price, no. Mr. Quigley. Mr. Quigley, no. Mrs. Roby. Aye. Mrs. Roby, aye. Mr. Rogers. Aye. Mr. Rogers, aye. Mr. Robo Allard. Mr. Rubisberger. No. Mr. Rubisberger, no. Mr. Rutherford. Mr. Rutherford, aye. Mr. Ryan. Mr. Ryan, no. Mr. Serrano. Mr. Serrano, no. Mr. Simpson. Mr. Simpson, no. Mr. Stewart. Mr. Stewart, aye. Mrs. Torres. Mrs. Torres, no. Mr. Vesklowski. Mr. Vesklowski, no. Ms. Wasserman Schultz. Ms. Wasserman Schultz, no. Mrs. Watson Coleman. Mrs. Watson Coleman, no. Mr. Womack. Mr. Womack, aye. Does any member wish to record their vote or change Mr. their Simpson. vote? Mr. Simpson. Mr. Simpson. Mr. Simpson. Mr. Simpson. Mr. Simpson, aye. Ms. Frankel. Ms. Frankel. No. Ms. Frankel, no. That's it. Seeing them, the clerk will tally. Hmm? Okay, members, we're almost there, and they're holding the vote for us. On this vote, the A's are 23, the nays are 27. Is she ready? Is that 27? Yep. The amendment is not adopted. Is there any further amendment or discussion? Seeing none, I recognize the gentlewoman from Ohio for a motion, and I ask for your support for this bill. Madam Chairwoman, I move to favorably report the Agriculture, Rural Development, Food, and Drug Administration Related Agencies Appropriation Act 2020 to the House. The question is on the motion. All those in favor say aye. 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 In the opinion of the chair, oh, those opposed. <laughs> those opposed. Those opposed, in case there are any, those opposed say no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. Oh, boy. A recorded vote has been requested. All those in favor of a recorded vote, raise your hand. A sufficient number being in support, a recorded vote is ordered. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Adderholt. Ms. Mr. Adderholt, no. Mr. Aguilar. Mr. Aguilar, aye. Mr. Amaday. Mr. Bishop. Aye. Mr. Bishop, aye. Mrs. Bustos. Mrs. Bustos, aye. Mr. Calvert. Mr. Calvert, no. Mr. Carter. Mr. Carter, no. Mr. Cartwright. Mr. Cartwright, aye. Mr. Case. Mr. Case, aye. Ms. Clark. Ms. Clark, aye. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole, no. Mr. Christ. Mr. Christ, aye. Mr. Cuellar. Mr. Cuellar, aye. Mr. Loro. Mr. Loro, aye. Mr. diaz Bellart. Mr. diaz Bellart, no. Mr. Fleischman. Mr. Fleischman, no. Mr. Fortenberry. Mr. Fortenberry, no. Ms. Frankel. Ms. Frankel, aye. Ms. Granger. Ms. Granger, no. Mr. Graves. Mr. Graves, no. Dr. Harris. Dr. Harris, no. Mr. Rare Butler, Mr. Hurd. Mr. Hurd, no. Mr. Joyce. Mr. Joyce, no. Ms. Captor. Ms. Captor, aye. Mr. Kilmer. Mr. Kilmer, aye. Mrs. Kirkpatrick. Mrs. Kirkpatrick, aye. Mrs. Lawrence. Mrs. Lawrence, aye. Ms. Lee. Ms. Lee, aye. Mrs. Lowy. Aye. Mrs. Lowy, aye. Ms. McCollum. Ms. McCollum, aye. Ms. Ming. Ms. Ming, aye. Mr. Molinar. Ms. Molinar, no. Mr. Newhouse. Mr. Newhouse, no. Mr. Palazzo. Mr. Palazzo, no. Ms. Pingree. Ms. Pingree, aye. Mr. Pocan. Mr. Pocan, aye. Mr. Price. Mr. Price, aye. Mr. Quigley. Mr. Quigley, aye. Mrs. Roby. Mrs. Roby, no. Mr. Rogers. Mr. Rogers, no. Ms. Robo Allard. Mr. Rupesberger. Mr. Rupesberger, no. Mr. Rutherford. Mr. Rutherford, no. Mr. Ryan. Mr. Ryan, aye. Mr. Serrano. Mr. Serrano, aye. Mr. Simpson. Mr. Simpson, no. Mr. Stewart. Mr. Stewart, no. Mrs. Torres. Mrs. Torres, aye. Mr. Viskowski. Mr. Viskowski, aye. Ms. Wasserman Schultz. Ms. Wasserman Schultz, aye. Mrs. Watson Coleman. Mrs. Watson Coleman, aye. Mr. Womack. Mr. Womack, no. Ma'am. 
Does any member wish to record their vote or change their vote? Mr. Ruppersberger, aye. That's it? She did not. Anything else? Does any member wish to record their vote or change their vote? Seeing none, the clerk will tally. On this vote, the ayes are 29, the noes are 21. The motion is agreed to. Oh, I ask unanimous consent that the staff be permitted to make technical and conforming changes to the bill and report just approved. Seeing no objections, so ordered. Chair, may the minority staff have three days as well. Of course. Thank you. As unanimous consent. Without objection, the committee stands adjourned. All right, good vote. <laughs>